I uh, think that's going to help. I don't think so. Nope. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, I could freeze and disappear any second because uh, uh, yesterday I was trying to Zoom with Stephanie and Norman Cabrera and Kate were over at my house yesterday helping Stephanie celebrate her birthday since I can't be there. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to Zoom and every fucking five minutes it was like, (laughs) you know, and then it would cut off and then it would come back and we'd have to rejoin. And it was, so finally I just went, have fun, happy birthday. Talk to you later. <laughs> I just yeah. got off the zoom. So, so, uh, anything could happen folks on this episode with, and spe- um, speaking of which, what episode is it? Uh, 29, 29 episode 29. Yeah. You know, I've been thinking about this and I, I it really kind of dawned on me after this last episode that we did that we didn't have a topic we were just it was just us catching up and reading the letters and whatnot i think we need to start having a topic yeah and i had a couple ideas we're going to do a topic next episode and it's going to be horror films that we loved that deserve a sequel but never got one so let's hear some of your input we'll tell you our picks it doesn't have to be a, a film that obviously any film can have a sequel, even if the killer died or whatever. There's all they always bring them back. Or a movie, you know, that 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 was really good that did surprisingly well, but for whatever reason didn't get a sequel, and vice versa. A movie that was mm-hmm. good that didn't do well, and that's why it didn't get a sequel. You know well, I mean? that's probably going to be the case with a lot of our picks. You know, yeah. I mean, I can sure. think of a cop like couple off my top of my head, like. That I, you know, like the Fun House. I would have loved to have seen a sequel to the Fun House, but I don't think it yeah. was a hit by any means. You no. know, yeah, but the Fun House would have been a great sequel for sure. Yeah, but what's our topic this this round? Oh, guru, oh horror. Well, I think we're just gonna chat, and then we're gonna. <laughs> what was that? I don't know. I think I, I think my balloon is leaking. I don't know what's going on. Um, <laughs> I think today we'll just we'll just talk about. I, I made a list of a th- few things I wanted to touch on, but obviously we have our guest today, writer director Marcus Dunstan and his writing partner Patrick Melton. They're going to be stopping by and chatting it up a little bit. A couple things. I, I finally watched that Cream doc, and it uh-huh. was pretty much what you said. It was crazy. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. I mean, it was like, it was, it should have been called the the legend of Lester Bangs is what the, what yeah. it should have been subtitled. And it was entertaining, but it was like, yeah, I mean, okay, yeah. we get it. You guys were rebels, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, it was fun. I enjoyed it. I just watched that rock and roll fantasy camp documentary. Oh, I've been dying to see that. How was it? It's not good. It oh. is. It's basically a commercial for rock and roll fantasy camp. It's a one big long commercial. And it's all over the place. You know how documentaries, they, you know, you start from the beginning and work your way through this, yeah. this like starts at the end and then goes to the the guy who created its history, but then it cuts away from there and goes to Alice Cooper. And then it cuts away from there and goes to some, some kid in Pittsburgh who's a guitar player who wants to go. It's so all over the place, but basically, yeah, it's just a big, long, boring commercial for rock and roll fantasy camp. That's, oh, that's disappointing. See, I was hoping yeah. there would be a lot of like some stories of failed musicians who this is what they're trying to do. And maybe they are terrible and we get to see how terrible they are. <laughs> no, no, it, no such luck. <laughs> oh, oh, well, I had this funny thing happen the other day. I stopped at What's it called? Yoko no show. No, yo, the, Beef ball place? Yoshinoya. Yeah, is that what it's called? Okay. I think it's Yoshinoya Beef yeah. Ball. Noho Hank on Barry loves Yoshinoya Beef Ball. I love that place. And I, I don't go there often. There aren't too many in Orange County. Uh-huh. And I was yeah. up in LA and I saw one and I was hungry. And I'm like, hey, I'm going to go there because I never just stumble upon those places. So I went in, I'm standing in line. And there was about t- 12 people in there. And I'm sitting there waiting for my food. And all of a sudden, Sweet Caroline comes on the the you know and it's i'm sitting there tapping along to i'm not really thinking about it and it gets to the part it gets to the 
ba 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 part. And I kind of look around like, are we going to do this? Are we going to do uh, this? <laughs> and I realized I was the only white guy in the room. Oh, <laughs> and, and we were not doing this. <laughs> in fact, nobody even like nodded their head to it. It was just like, right. it wasn't on. I'm the only person hearing it, but yeah. I was like, ah, oh well. That just goes to show you how good of a time you have, no matter where you go. Dude, I bring the fun everywhere. I do. You do. You're I just do. a big bucket of fucking fun. That's what you do. Uh, uh, did you see my uh, post I made uh, like a week or so ago about the Jesus pamphlet I got in the mail? Uh, I think I, I did. I probably forgot about it. But yes, that, it looked just like Hart, Hart Bachner from Die Hard. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah you yeah. know. <laughs> I was like, I, I was dying when I opened that thing. I'm like, first off, who sent this to me? I mean, it was a handwritten envelope and it came from a P.O. box in my city. Huh. So I'm like, who sent this to me? One of our friends out there who's watching the show thinks you need a little religion in your life, buddy. It's, sounds like it. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I finally watched after... Yeah. The the prodding of 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 our peeps out there. I finally Michael watched. Gorman. No, I haven't oh. finished it. <laughs> oh. right. I watched the Never Hike Alone Jason oh. fan film. And let's let's hear it. I'm sure our friends out there are dying to hear your much better than I expected. It's a really good concept. I like the idea. The basic oh. idea is a, a this guy is a sort of a, a travel vlogger who goes on hikes by himself and kind of, it's very like 127 hours, you know, James Franco running around by himself, but he stumbles upon the old camp crystal Lake. And Uh it's pretty cool because the way they set it up, it's like, he's basically going to all the spots where the people were killed in the original film. And like, there's like these little markings from like the crime investigating thing. Like it'll say like one with a ribbon and two. So like you're figuring out it's every spot he's going to is where the famous death scenes happened. Okay. And it's pretty cool. I, I, I liked it. I mean, I had a little bit of issue with it. Number one, it should have been sackhead. Jason absolutely should have been sackhead. Jason would have been scarier, would have worked better for, for this concept. In my right. opinion, I also thought the guy that played Jason was a little too, you know, kind of, uh, he, he, a little, I mean, like, I don't know. It was also some of the sound design whenever he would take a step, it was like, boom, boom, boom. I mean, it was a little, that was a little much, but, uh, the thing that was interesting is the way it ended. Uh, I didn't realize Tom Matthews who plays Tommy Jarvis reprises his role as Tommy Jarvis. Oh, wow. But that's where I think they missed the mark. They could have really had a cool ending with him popping up to sort of save the day as old Tommy Jarvis. But they tried to write in this thing of him being an ambulance driver and 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 the whole ambulance crew thing to me didn't work. If he had just shown up to kind of save him as Tommy Jarvis, I would have liked it a lot better. Mm. Um, But unfortunately, the 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 I thought. There's, I don't know who this person is. I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but there was a girl who played a, a, a she was like an ambulance worker, EMT. I thought suddenly the acting level just dropped drastically. Um, oh, <laughs> well, because the main guy is really yeah. good. The main right. guy is really good. Whoever that guy mm-hmm. is, he carries it. And then you get to the end where the only people he comes across are these two ambulance people. Right. And it just seems like it suddenly gets fan filmish, but right. then, then Tommy Jarvis shows up as the ambulance driver. And, you know, I mean, I'm assuming they put them in there to give us a couple kills cause there really isn't any kills in it. Right. But it's definitely the best thing I've seen in a while Friday 13th. Mm. I mean, it was, it was good. I mean, I'm, mm. I'm interested in seeing the follow up, the, the one about in the snow, never hike in the snow or something it's called. I don't know. I'll watch it. I haven't gotten to it yet, but I was pleasantly surprised. Okay. Yeah, I'd give it a shot. I will. I will uh, try to give that a shot. Yeah. You see anything? Watch anything lately? I've been pretty busy at work. I watched the Zack Snyder. Did we already talk about that? No. I watched the Zack Snyder Justice League. And after it took me about 
this is going to be an incredibly unpopular opinion. And it took me about four attempts to get through it. Mm -hmm. It's an awful film. It's actually worse than the actual cut, in my opinion. But I've been seeing all over the internet how it's a revelation and this is amazing. And 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 this kind of could could actually segue into our get off my lawn segment because yeah. now what I'm I'm reading all these stories on the internet about other movies that they want to recut and do this version and this director's version and well it's basically like now we're rehauling like you buy a mask from a company and you have to rehaul it for it to be good now now we're rehauling movies yeah. now we're going to get into that phase of I, I guarantee you this is what we're going to do now we're going to rehaul movies that have already come out dude, let's not dude. let's not concentrate on writing new fucking cool movies Let's just rehaul the ones that have already come out, and they're well, not even sequels. It's the same movie that we're going to rehaul. It's kind of happening already. Fans are yeah. going back and like redoing. Like, have you seen like the, the the deep fake guys have redone the Mark Hamill and the Mandalorian that looks way oh. better? And they're like oh. showing. It's like, guys, we have the technology. What's going on? They redid Princess Leia, and mm-hmm. and it looks so much better. They even went back and redid all the Jeff Bridges stuff in Tron Legacy, and it mm-hmm. blows it away. So, it you know. It is, it's an interesting thing, but keep keep going. I know you're talking about something different, but I'm saying as far as fans doing rehauls, they're kind of right. doing it too. Yeah, I'm I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of this whole trend that's about to hit. That's going to be one after another. Um, I, I I I just for fuck's sake, can we just make new movies, new yeah. original, cool stuff? I don't like it one bit. Um, I don't need to see the same movie reimagined i got a message from somebody recently saying hey now that they're redoing movies i heard they're going to do a suicide squad you know david Ayer cut and david Ayer went on line and said we're not doing it warner brothers doesn't want to do it no one wants to do it as much as i'd like to see that one because i think it would be better we shouldn't be doing it i don't i don't just let's just make some new original cool stories let's let's put our focus and energies into writing a good script and a good new movie it's driving me crazy well, so what is what is the thing that they just redid with jared leto and as the joker that's justice league oh it's in justice league yeah okay and it I'm... makes no sense it just appears like there's some dream alternate reality thing where batman's there with the joker and everybody i'm like what is what it's a great drinking game the new justice league it's a great drinking game have a shot every time there's a big sweeping shot going over an ocean into a bridge, through the bridge, down over the cities, down into the buildings. Like the, the whole movie is just that. It's just nonstop sweeping. It, you're just going, oh my God. And then every time Wonder Woman's on screen, every single time, they're, they're really trying to do that John Williams thing where each character has their own theme. So yeah. every time they're on camera, their theme pops up and the themes don't go together. Like they don't gel like John Williams. It's all kind of a cohesive operatic kind of thing. This is all over the place. You got the Batman thing. And then Wonder Woman comes on every single time. She sounds every single time she can come on. And there's this weird music that goes. And (laughs) then she leaves and that ends. But then 30 seconds later, she comes back and it's laughable. It's so laughable. When you watch this movie, you're going to laugh your ass off. I just sat there going, wow. But the internet and the world and the audiences are going crazy. So that just goes to show you how out of touch I am. So I don't, you know, I don't know I'm, what's... I'm not a big superhero <laughs> guy. I'm just, I mean, I, I've like, everybody's going ape shit over WandaVision. I haven't even cared to watch no. it. I mean, I, I don't, I, I'm, it's not really my thing. I mean, I can, I mean, it was fun at first. You know, and Iron Man and Thor and like, oh, this is cool. But then it's just like, Jesus Christ, they're throwing every character yeah. I've never heard of in the mix, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I'm just. But I'm not a I'm not a video game guy. And you're watching video games. They bore yeah. me like all the action action sequences put me to sleep. I swear to God, that's where I check out. I check out during the action sequences. I like just start because they go on forever. 
Yeah. And they're just the same thing. And there's always an alien with a hammerhead. It's always got <laughs> some hammerhead with the armor over the hammerhead. And then the armor comes off. But he's still got it. Everyone's got a hammerhead in these movies. I'm like, what does it deal with the hammerheads? And, and it's just like everything just starts to look the same. You know, it's kind of going to a buffet. It's kind of going to like going to hometown buffet and you got your macaroni and cheese and your potatoes and your steaks and your this, but everything is the same color and everything tastes exactly the same. It's supposed to be different, but it's not really. It all has the same taste because it's all cooked on the same thing, you know, and you're like going, oh my God, I'm so bored. And I work on most of these movies. <laughs> That's what's funny. <laughs> In the case of Justice League, do you think that a lot of this or any of this had something to do with the whole Josh, Joss Whedon like controversy of what's going on with him and you know I, I don't know I, I don't know I think all this stuff was in the works before that but I'm sure it helped that that yeah. that PR machine surely fueled the success of this thing you know and I think people are easily fooled and, and you know everybody just wants a big bowl of hot macaroni and cheese unfortunately the macaroni and cheese is tepid at best so I don't know then I wrote down another get off my lawn thing. I was, mm. this is kind of, uh, this is a side by side. It, it's all took place in the same venue. Okay. I was in the airport to fly here and I'm yeah. sitting there and this happens every time I'm in an airport, I sit down, I'm waiting for my flight and there's always some guy behind you on his phone in a public place talking at the top of his lungs you could hear his whole conversation and it's annoying as fuck yeah it's like i i don't want to hear your conversation i know you're killing time man but the guy's just sitting there going man then she came over the other day and i told her if you want to remember and he's right there and you're going it's six in the morning it's six <laughs> in the morning what what do you you're I, i'm not even awake yet i it, at six in the morning i'm in a crowded airport and i gotta hear this joker <laughs> who's got to hear you know everybody's thing and then it, it, it's like it's it's that and then the other thing was it was the same flight i got on the plane again six in the morning everybody had to get up you know everyone on the plane had to get up at like three three or four in the morning right mm -hmm. nobody got a good night's sleep so people get on the plane and they don't pull their shades down. Oh, I hate that. Everybody's trying to sleep, but dickhead over here who's passed out snoring with drool has his shades up. The sun's coming up. It's shining in across the plane into your eyes. And he's just like, and everybody's got their shades open. I'm going, it's six in the morning. We all got up at three in the morning. Shut your fucking shades so I can get some sleep on this flight. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, my issue with that is the ones that aren't asleep that everybody's trying to sleep. And there's the one guy with the newspaper. You got to have the yeah. thing open. Cause I got to, I got to read my paper. Can't just use the yeah. light. Got to have it open. Yeah. And everybody's looking at, I'm sitting there with my hoodie like this. And I'm going, you know, yeah. if somebody falls asleep, with the thing open, I walk over there and I fucking shut it. I, I, I don't give a fuck. I, 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 I should will. do that, but then a fight's going to start. And the plane's no, gonna and if the guy wakes gonna, up, I'll go ahead. I'm going to get a sky marshal and fucking shoots me in the head. <laughs> yeah. I do have a quick get off my lawn. I think I've kind of mentioned this before, but it happened again last night. The, 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 the checkout at the grocery store, the self-check. I mean, every time with the self-check, you try to do it to save time and you scan something and then it'll it'll like something will happen and it'll say uh, assistant coming uh, yeah. assistant com and you're just like fuck what all i did was scan the goddamn thing i want to buy or everything's fine and then you put it in the wait thing and it says please add item to and yeah. it's like it's there you know it's and then there it, i can't help it that twizzlers doesn't weigh enough yeah and it, then it freezes <laughs> the whole system and then it's wait for right. attendant and you're right. sitting there waiting Longer than if you would have just gotten the regular line. Yeah. By the way, remember I was praising the movie Surf 2? Yes. It is getting a Blu-ray release from Vinegar Syndrome for the first wow. time ever. Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> the only thing that sucks is right now they're only offering it as this like weird sort of 
movie club membership thing that's like 160 bucks and you get a couple other movies i don't care about Mm -hmm. so i'm being told that in may it might come out on its own Mm -hmm. if they don't sell out of it i don't know what that means i'm just like you know i don't want to buy all this shit i don't want i just want this movie right if anybody from vinegar syndrome's watching this just send me a copy for god's sakes I'll, 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 I'll pimp it like crazy. Um, but anyway, if I have to get it later on eBay for 80 bucks, right. At least I'll be paying less than the 160, whatever their club thing is. Um, right. but I'll do that. So we have a few questions. I want to try to get them in here before Marcus and, and Patrick show up. All right. And just uh, so everybody knows, I might have to sneak out of here. during the interview or for the interview because I'm at work, everyone. I am working and I'm here for you as much as I can be. You're cutting into our time with your excuses. Kevin Wrightson, Kevin Wrightson says, I have a get off my lawn. People that do not return their shopping carts to the cart return. Just thought I'd share. Love the improvements on the show and the new logo. Thank you, That's Kevin. That's a good one. That's a good one. I'm right there with you, buddy. I always take my carts to the return thing. I always do. I'm one of those guys. As do I. Yeah. It's good right. exercise. Get a little in every here and there. Get a few steps. Yeah. Casey Solom said, Chris, your feeling good moment about this upcoming October is reassuring and contagious. Yeah, I'm it super, is. I'm super excited to see Halloween Kills. Thank you both for keeping up this podcast. It really has gotten me through this pandemic while working at the same time. Question for you both. Do either of you have a stupid human trick? If so, let's see. Do you, oh. have, do you have like a, a thing you can do that's... Yeah, it's makeup. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's my stupid human trick? I used to be able to tie a cherry stem into a knot with, with my, without, in my mouth with my tongue. I used to be able to do that. Audrey Horn style, huh? Yeah. Twin Peaks reference. Yeah. Uh, what's my stupid human trick? Um, I can pick up pretty much anything with my feet because I have a giant gap between my toes, my big toe and my next toe giant. Like it's huge. Like I'd show it to you right now, but everyone would cut out and and get grossed out. It's huge. It's like Fred Flintstone huge. I picked up a bowling pin, I think once with my foot. Um, that's impressive. It, I, I can do it. Um, you know, you're lying on the couch, remote controls over there. I'm not sitting up. I'm grabbing that thing with my foot. <laughs> I do that too. I call it monkey toes. I said I always say to Nay, I go, here comes monkey toes, and I grab something. I don't know. I really don't have any any weird thing that I I do. Um, I have yeah, this one. Okay, I have this one ankle that I can crack continuously, like like it and it drives people crazy when I do it. Um, mm. Kind of hard to do. You do, do it right? for people a lot. No, it just, crazy. it's like if it gets brought up, like, you know, weird injury things, I go, well, I got, I, it's probably a skateboarding injury where I can just keep cracking it over and over again. And it, people go, ah, 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 stop that. You know, right. I don't know if that's a trick or just a disability. I don't know what it L six, six, six incubo is back. My lady and I are diving into some made for TV movies from the early nineties. The presence was one that stuck with me, which is pretty much the plot of the show Lost. Any TV movie broadcasts on a list recommendation? It doesn't need to be early 90s. Quick edit. Seen lots of appreciation for class in 1999. Saw it when it came out. It's a gem of its time. I I have one, what? but it's not 90s. It's The Boy in the Plastic Bubble with John Travolta. Boy in the Plastic Bubble, like normal people. The Sean Cassidy, Linda Pearl. Oh, uh, yeah. There's also Trilogy of Terror or The Night Stalker, which were made for TV movies. Those are great. Yeah, yeah. Kiss Meets the Phantom. Of the Park. Yeah, no, that's another classic made-for-TV gem. Bad Ronald. That was a made-for-TV. <laughs> Remember that one? Yeah. Where he lived in the walls? Bad Ronald. <laughs> <laughs> Sawyer Smoke. What's up, Sawyer? Said, another great episode, dudes. Love the My Bloody Valentine shirt. Have you guys went over your favorite movie releases of 2020? He's got a howl. That howling shirt's pretty badass. Badass, right? Yeah. Who did that? Is that Cafferty Colors? This is uh, Fright Rags, I believe. Oh, 
did you go to cavity colors yet uh, i have not i i I, you know, I was in quarantine. I got out of quarantine and went right to work. And I've been working every single day, uh, including today. So uh, I will get there. Um, I'm going to go visit those those fine folks over there. Check out my my death metal haunted mansion shirt. Sweet. It says there's no turning back now. Sweet. Yeah. Um, favorite movies of 2020. <laughs> what? I mean, God, there isn't oh. much... I, yeah. I kind of want to forget 2020. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't have a favorite movie for 2020. It's that's, that's yet to be seen. I think that's something that, you know, give it, give it five, 10 years so I can look back at 2020 and go, Oh yeah, I remember that. Oh yeah. Yeah. I don't. Speaking of which, I just saw that movie, the rental Dave Frank. Yes. Film. Yeah. Have you seen it yet? I haven't. I'm going to watch it. What'd you think? You you liked it, huh? It, it's good. It, yeah, it took me by surprise. One of our, I forgot, one of our people here um, suggested it and The Beach House, which I haven't seen yet. And I love Dan Stevens. Um, I'm a big, big fan of him. If you ever saw The Guest, he was the main guy in that. And he's also a very good comedic actor. He was in that weird Swedish movie with uh, Will Ferrell where they're the there's oh, yeah. Eurovision. Eurovision. Yeah. Eurovision. Yeah. He was great in that. Um, okay. but anyway, it was uh it was a really good, like it took kind of took me by surprise. Um, you know, horror film. It's one of those everybody does the wrong thing kind of movies, which does okay. kind of you're just like, God damn it. But at the same yeah. time, you understand why they're doing it a little bit. But dude, this is is it's dude exclamation mark. So it's more like dude. dude. Um, I'd love to see a Jaws the Revenge commentary slash review from Sean. Okay. Zero Mom is terrific, by the way. <laughs> Loved it since I first saw it in the cinema. Damn fine Irish accent from Christopher. Well, it's actually not Irish. It's Scottish. But thanks, man. Yeah. Joker said, Chris and Sean, check out Revenge on Shudder. It's pretty damn good and was pleasantly surprised. A lot I of- did see that. You did? And? That's the one. Is that the one with the girl that's partying in a house with a couple guys or something? And then they end up like trying to kill her or leave her for dead. And then she's got to she's got to get revenge on these guys. Yeah, I think I, I've seen that. He said a lot of over the top gore. Is that yeah, true? there's a lot of over the top gore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. Well, is, would you recommend it? Is it worth checking out? Um, sure. I don't know. You know, I don't know the taste of people these days. I'm not a big fan of, of the misogyny of raping and trying to kill a woman. And then she comes back to get revenge. It never really pays off as much as you want it to. They never really get what they deserve. So those kind of movies are a little hit and miss with me. But uh, I think overall, if you're a horror fan and you're into that shit. Sure, you'd like it. It's not a it's not a bad made film. It's well made. Kind of has a uh, I spit in your I spit on your grave meets hills have eyes kind of vibe. Hmm. Not a fan of I spit on your grave. Said also John Five and Robert Englund would be great guests. Uh, John Five will be coming on at some point to answer Chris's questions as to why I refused pain meds after my surgery. I actually had a really rough battle with heroin, and really just drugs in general for nine years. I won't say I'm a recovering addict as I was never in any programs, and I'll still drink occasionally. I just do my best to abstain from opioids and I'm not doing burpees, nor am I jogging just yet, but I'm getting there. Ha ha. By the <laughs> next episode, I'll be tip top. Much love guys. Well, that kind of went dark a little it bit. It went dark fast, but you know, but the word burpees, well. but you know, anytime you say burpees it always perks things up. So. Yeah. Salvador Hugo. Ooh. Uh, Definitely prefer both of you guys on screen at the same time. I like to see each other's reactions. Yes, that was a mistake from last time. I apologize. Speaking of mistakes from last time, I made a big boo-boo. Somebody pointed it out. Um, what the fuck is it? I'm sure. I'll... Oh, here it is. Hungry Wives said. Hungry Wives. I've said it before, but as much as I love the guests, I really dig the episodes where it's just you guys. Oh, thanks, buddy. Our views per episode say otherwise, but thank you. <laughs> exactly. Um, 
you two are the show, not the guests. So episodes are a total blast. And being and being said, we are not going to talk about the fact that Sean Christopher was wrong about Jason Clark when it's obvious he watched Devil all the time and not Silk Road. Yeah. So when I was talking about this movie I saw called Silk Road. I was thinking devil all the time, which I had talked about in a previous episode, but right. I had just watched this movie Silk Road that also stars Jason Clark. Right. And I completely mixed them up. So well, my mistake. You know what? You're human. And that's very easy to do when you have a, a devil times five Silk Road devil. What's the other one? Uh, devil all the time. Devil all the time. Devil times five. So, I mean, I, you know what? I could see why you could do that. So. And I got to bring this up. I got sent a, a record label called Burning Witches Records. Has a new release by, I think the band is called Devil Times Nine. <laughs> nice. And and it's uh, it's called The Burning Tapes is the name of the album. I, I was right. just laughing my ass off. Like, what are the odds? Well, there's Devil Times Nine, Devil Times Fine five and the thing with two heads daniel caruso said uh, hey guys great show oh sorry wherever wherever the camera is great show as always i love the new logo for the video class of 1999 was another go-to film i watch when there is nothing else on definitely glad it's spring and weather where i live northeast is getting warmer days are getting longer and i'm really excited about the coming halloween season to be back to some normalcy to answer Chris's question as to what I am molding and casting is the Skull Island series of kits. There are different scenes from the original King Kong, but on the side of that, I am casting small and large skulls, some rotten, some fresh, keeping myself surrounded by things I love. You guys, your fans, my family, and all the horror stuff that we create together makes me happy. Speaking of which, are you excited about the new Kong versus Godzilla opening this week? Uh, no. You don't want to see a big CGI fight, no? Like no, <laughs> that bores me. It bores me. I'd rather if it was two guys in suits over a miniature city, I'd be all in. I would be all in. But no, I'm not interested really in that. And uh, also, they cheated and make made Kong way bigger than he's supposed to be in order to fight Godzilla. So I don't like that big cheat. So no, I'm not interested. Okay, get off his Kong. <laughs> Get off Kong. <laughs> Matt Lucas said, hey, guys, another great show. As always, Sean, when you edited in that Colin Murdy moment after you read my comment saying Christopher's accent cracked me up, I almost spit out food I was eating. I was laughing so damn hard. Also, I recently listened to the Slices podcast with Jason Pellegra interviewing Tom Matthews. It was a great interview. I think he would be a great guest for your show. Okay. Take that. All right under advisement i like tom he's a good guy he's a friend could Indeed. probably make that happen did you watch that episode does he do you know the moment he's talking about it was pretty funny i, I, I don't what was he talking about oh there was some moment where we were just talking about colin murdy right and then colin he, murdy. sorry yeah and you did that and right. i put it in like a crazy echo chamber and pulled your face real tight colin murdy. And I'll probably do that again just when you did it there. And it was just like this. It just came out of nowhere. And it, I was just being silly. And it, it, it ended up making me laugh, too. So I'm glad he enjoyed it. Call it Murdy. Call it Murdy. What are you doing, Call it Murdy? Speaking of which, do we have any message, anything from our, our, our friend Colin Murdy? The, the, mur the murderer. The murderer. Oh, the murderer. I like that one. See? Oh, Poor Colin didn't write us this week. I feel sad. Oh, I'm so disappointed in you, Colin. Man. Colin, what happened? Now to your name is lad? Colin. It's Colin Murderer. You're a Colin Murderer. Not a couple letters, too. What do we got here? Letters. We get letters. Hey, guys. After watching you guys try the Affy Tapple beer, I could not help but send another one for you oh. to try at your own risk. Sean is aware of this one since I messaged him about it. Another local Chicago brewery decided to brew a rendition of the Shamrock Shake and an IPA. Oh. Enjoy, if possible, to see the full green color. It might be best to pour into a glass instead of drinking it out of the can. I'll, I'll do that. 
Also enjoy the stickers. He sent stickers. He sent for some reason. He sent me a Fruity Pebble stickers. He knows I like. Oh, fruit. thanks for the stickers. Uh, get off my lawn. Nice. A couple of those. Uh, Lovely. Some more. Get off my lawns. Uh, and, and this guy. All so. right. We had get off my lawn on the back of one of those T-shirts, and Sean didn't feel that it was worthy being on our t-shirt well yeah. i had two reasons number one i i since it was just the basic logo i kind of felt like let's just keep it simple plus it bumped the price up having a back logo which made the shirt more expensive um i kind of feel like we need a dedicated get off my lawn design and and let's 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 go with that so i concur i will come up with the get off my lawn design speaking of which Brett Stortenbecker, who's the one who sent us the Affy Tapple and now the Shamrock Shake, which I received the day after you left town. Oh. So I'll either have to ship it to you or bring it if I come uh, visit or wait till yeah. you get back. All right. But uh, it's a very intriguing can. He has a get off my lawn. He said, any drivers minus elderly or disabled individuals that wait for one of the front parking spots to open up when there were spots just a couple spaces away open. This leads to other drivers waiting behind, blocking them from proceeding to where they need to go. All the time, sitting wasted, they could have parked in another spot a few spaces away. I, I know what you're talking about. That's annoying. Yes, I agree. And it's funny, last night I was coming home from somewhere and I got to the stop sign that's just before I turned into my neighborhood. Stop and the, there was a guy kind of, on the other lane next to me fucking just blazes right through the stop sign does not stop at all and it was like mm. first thing i thought of was you as you were talking about how that was pissing People me off. Are, that's what they're doing now they're not caring about stop signs or stop lights all the rules it's anarchy uh daniel caruso actually sent us a letter <laughs> look at the pictures he added <laughs> i can't see it you see it? It's it's a it's Caru it's Caruso. Oh, okay. Session nine. Nice. Um, to Sean and Chris, I hope you guys are doing awesome. Again, I want you to know how much I appreciate your podcast. My wife now watches with me, and it's always fun hearing the interviews, laughs, and really cool topics you guys cover. Well, hello to your wife if she's watching. Hi. It always feels like you two and all the other fans are right there hanging out weekly together. What a great experience your show brings. I contacted you, Sean, a couple of weeks ago. I wasn't able to catch your last live show as I was in the hospital with my dad. He had taken a bad fall. Just wanted to let you know he's fine, able to get around again. I've enclosed an envelope and cardboard self-addressed envelope or self-addressed blah, blah, blah for pitcher of the woman carrying your heads. <laughs> I think he already, <laughs> I think he already received it. I sent it already. Okay. It would be awesome to have your autographs. Yes. I, yep. We did that. Thanks again. Thank you for what you do. Stay well, friends, Daniel Caruso. You're welcome, sir. And I, I believe yeah. he already received it because I think he messaged me saying he couldn't believe how fast he got it. Well, Sean's Sean's, he doesn't mess around. He wants all you guys to be happy. He's on top of it. He came over I think it was the day before I left, and I, we sat down and signed a bunch of those things. He was like, our friends want shit, so we got to do it before he leaves. So signed signed a bunch of stuff. So if you want one, come and get it. Got to do it for the peeps. Well, we're creeping up here on the, on the interview about to start, so maybe I should kind of skim these and see if I can pick out a really good question. David Gibson, hey, guys, love the show. Completely addicted. Can't wait for new episodes all the time. I'm wondering, though, if you will be releasing more episodes of the podcast for listening purposes. I don't always get a chance to watch the videos because of that stupid, you know, work thing. In any case, I will still try to sneak in some viewing every now and then. Anyway, keep up the great work. Yes, I do intend on getting those damn audio only versions up. I, I promise I got to I got to make that a priority. We had a couple people, Paul Hausner and Strum and Skull, both asking about your amp. One he want, one guy, Paul, wants to know what guitar is that you play? And Strum and Skull wants to know, is your Marshall amp a solid state or tube? It's a solid state. Mm -hmm. I do have a tube. It's in the garage. Uh, where it, the head needs some some work. That one in that room is a solid state. And uh, what guitars do I play? I have Gibson Les Paul, which is I love. 
very much. I got my Fender Telecaster, Joe Strummer Telecaster. I got an SG, a Gretsch hollow body, big, big old Brian Setzer hollow body, which I love very much. I have, I have about eight, ten guitars, Fender jazz bass. I have a lot of stuff. What I'm going to try to do is put some of these questions for the next episode. I will try to, to work them in. I apologize. Are you shooting something in Atlanta? I am. I'm in the, I'm, I'm just getting ready to start a, a, a show I've been prepping and I have prep to do. And I actually might have to, I have to, I can't stay the whole time. Unfortunately, I, I'm, I feel awful because my phone, my phone just started blowing up with uh, some emergency stuff going on tomorrow with our big tests. Yeah. It's usually Sunday when everyone realizes, oh shit. <laughs> always. It's always Sunday, man. I'm like, Really, yeah. guys? right when you get comfortable, you're like, oh, maybe not. No, no, yeah, no. yeah. But it's probably like, like four o'clock there, so yeah, right around four o'clock. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> What's up? Hey, there we are. Yeah. Oh, He's Mr. Nelson. Mm-hmm. How you are you, sir? Last time we were hanging out was at Adrian Lynn Booth's birthday party with B.J. McDonald during a Spasmatics concert in Santa Monica. Oh my God! How long ago was that? I think it was last week. Or five. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure. Don't say that. Don't say that because you're going to freak me out, man. I'm going to get freaked out because that shit happens to me. It's like, man, I just saw you yesterday. I'm like, you did? Because yeah. I was in China. That's freaking me out. Man. Dude. <laughs> yeah. And like, Sean Clark, we go way back with Sean Clark and all, in Pepper throughout the last time you and I were digitally communicating was over the magnificent autographed Freddie Dunks. Those are amazing. And I don't like, know if you where know. are they? Are they in there somewhere? They're in a case, man. Yeah. <laughs> They're in a shoe case. They're in the yeah. shoe throne. It's I don't know. It, it was neat. I mean, that that was really cool. But then stepping back, the last time we were in a room together, and I still have the video somewhere. I was it was talking. Like, uh, I was just Douglas telling uh, Patrick about it. Yeah, with Douglas yeah. Tate and Sean was like, we pushed Sean to work right away. It's like, all right, the door is opening. There's yeah. Michael. Like, come on in. And yeah, Tate was so nice. Just like really cool. Well, He's we're great. gonna we're gonna touch on that a little bit. Hmm. Great. And uh, I'll see if he's gonna jump back in or not. But if not, let's let's go ahead and officially begin. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so, Patrick, Marcus, thank you for joining me. It's been a while since I've seen you both. We yeah. Were, we yeah. Were and you Thanks. still don't age, which is rocking. <laughs> One day you're going to see me, though. It's going to be yeah. like a year, and then you're going to go, oh, sh- whoa, what happened? <laughs> I know it's going to happen because it happens to everybody I know. It's like, dude, that guy looks amazing. Then I don't see them for like a year, and then it's like, whoa, oh God, Jesus, it yeah. hits you. It, yeah. so those good genes only last so long. Yeah. Well, a- I, Actors, it happens. Like male actors, and suddenly yeah. just one day you're like, oh, they're old now. Okay. So Chris froze on us mid-sentence and uh and he he also is in the middle of some panic work Pro- production um, stuff i want to give an actress a, a wonderful shout out it was on a project but it was the actress her name is melissa bologna and it's super super nice and also like a a really good athlete and, and but also the neighbor, kind. The neighbor? And, uh, yes absolutely and in that one who uh you know fake bare feet but running when it was supposed to be really cold and it was just one of those nights where we were gifted with uh the best version of weather in november for that and but on this and the reason i was like yep she's in what she was doing shark lake and same scenario i'm not getting in there says the buff dude she is like well i am Boom! And then the entire crew is like, "What are you gonna do now?" Oh, I love that. <laughs> what <of you? sighs> Where'd you guys shoot that, by the way, neighbor? That was in Canton, Mississippi. Oh, so it was Mississippi, like it yeah. was in the film. Okay. Yep, absolutely. Okay. It was pretty. I mean, like that for as quick and strange um, as all the the confluence of events that happened there. It was it was a really cool place to shoot, and like because they preserved the time to kill stage that was built for that and they also had a lot of nice houses and for for crew and everybody to really make the most of it we also had a couple of holidays we were going into so it was nice to have thanksgiving together and you bonded with with everybody and then right before the ice storm uh that was going to represent december 24 5 6 came in we were all done 
and off we went. And then smack dab in the middle, our director of photography uh, had celebrated a birthday and he bought out a theater and took us all to the Force Awakens. <laughs> I mean, that was like, for it was just nonstop. Like, yeah, it was, it was the best of an experience, you know. Well, you know what's been- crazy about it? I, that movie just totally flew under the radar for me. Like, I didn't even know it happened. Still is under the radar. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's still never quite been released. Has, uh, it ever, has it ever had a Blu-ray release? There was uh, one uh, yeah. that I tracked down through Amazon or something, and it was really kind of hinky because you just put it in and the movie starts. Yeah. Like it was ripped I, at someone's home. Like it was, yeah, like it was a made-for-order type thing. Like if you were on Amazon, you ordered it. It was at some guy's house, and he was like, oh, shit, got to make a copy of the neighbor. And then, and then they sent it to you. It has that kind of vibe to it. Now, it, it. It was a real disappointment how that was released. It was like, um, it was, uh, who was it? Anchor was Bay. It? Anchor Bay, but it was like, it was, it was remember they, they were like on, right? So it was like. Stars, was the stars bottom, right? Yeah. And it was like their last movie. One of the last movies they put out, everyone was gone. So there's no promotion of it at all. And then Lionsgate has it now. And like the producers who are on it, they, they try to talk to Lionsgate and they don't even know they have it or care. Mm-hmm. Like they, they care enough not to give it back or do anything with it, but they don't do anything with it. Yeah. which is kind of a bummer, you know? Yeah, I had a real hard time finding it. I mean, because... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I, oh, oh, actually, it's called YouTube, and there's two copies right now, and I have... It's on, and I have commented <laughs> on them, of thanking them for putting it up in a sort of ironic way that the person who posted it hasn't quite caught on to my sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really... It's its like, release, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's still up there, and I was like, like it's like I go back and forth. That is good. Thanks for posting my movie on your YouTube channel. I guess like, no problem. <laughs> and that was that was a curious experience behind the scenes as well. Like, uh, but it also resulted in as a director my first tomato. So I was thrilled with that because you know after a while you're like, if it is horror, we were just getting raked across the coals. But hey, I I still love what we did. Mm-hmm. Uh, have to, uh, to to you know really support it and even even though it's the kid that might be bullied the most you're gonna love it no matter what so this was kind of neat where it was uh because th- what had happened with halloween had happened and this consolation prize was something that we'd written and tried to get made for almost 10 years and then we had this tiny chance that meant we had to do it for less do it faster do it better than the clock or uh, all the elements would allow and it just kind of worked. It was a really nice way to almost therapize one road not traveled and then go back to like, you know, we really were trying to set out to make thrillers that thrilled again. Mm-hmm. And the collector by road of popularity, the horror was anteed up because ultimately if it was someone trying to kill and someone trying to steal, that doesn't necessarily mean you need a lot of horror. It's, it's how close to the line you can get, but we you know, just jumped in. Um, but so the neighbor was really like, this was the thriller. So we wrote them like boom, boom, boom. Mm-hmm. And that's what was cool is to then go back. And it was neat. I also kind of thought of it in my head. It's like, well, this is the Arkin story in between. If we ever get to do another collector movie, like that was kind of my idea with Josh. He yeah. says, you dressed up like Eric Church, you hid in Mississippi, you sold drugs because you know how to do it. And you were just trying to get enough to buy the security system to maybe never meet the demon again. <laughs> Yeah, it was a great cast. I mean, I love Josh, oh, but I loved the 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 guy, the the comedian guy. But was Bill it? Angle. Yeah, it was yeah. good, right? Yeah, yeah. What a what a different side, you know? Yes. Oh, and he was so so kind and supportive, and like it it because I you know it's intimidating when there is clearly the biggest entity in the room is right here, and you're almost like really, and you're coming to the craft services with a folding table where like really yeah and he was in there just in there and and that support was remarkable that's and awesome. he liked what he was doing and you know and and man and and, in, and it wasn't like uh uh we had to 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 really even do a heck of a lot of work in the moment because he had so much time and used all this time to grow his hair and become this guy so it was as easy as flipping a switch and and yeah you know, it was all this wonderful conversation it was like you know i don't know if you're uh, humorous naturally, or if you've ever been in that tiny hotel room where the roaches are stirring around your ear and you just have to turn it on. And that switch just means I got to be funny right now. Or 
Mm. My kids don't eat. I can't do this. I can't fix the car and I can't get out of here. So they're like, now what if you as a genial man had to flip that switch the other way from time to time to provide for your family? And that might mean really scaring people, showing them the hammer, you know, like, oh, and then it, it was just kind of neat. So I think like every time you have a stand up comedy uh, that really goes off, it's like, oh, he's killing it. I was like, oh. What if we took that literally? <laughs> yeah. Still on, still on YouTube, and yeah. uh, just Serpents Kiss TV. I'm guessing they're not the copyright owner, but you know, whatever. <laughs> they, they've um, posted it, and they have 147,000 views. Wow. Yeah, not bad, right? So huh. 536 likes, 88. <laughs> so it's pretty good average for yeah, our movie. Real and I comment on it, <laughs> like, I, and no one replied to me yet. But the other one they replied to me. There's another <laughs> one they replied to me. But this is like a this is like must be a foreign copy because it's from Salt Salt Entertainment, which is uh the, uh, was the German I think just distributor well, of it. Plus we did two different versions. So if it's called Neighbor B O U R, then the the there's some just little tiny differences throughout for the for those markets. But it, oh yeah, it was neat. It still gave a hell of a lot of great life experiences and, and, and joy. Uh, and also, it was a great experience, wasn't it? I mean, yeah, was I mean, it was, it was good shooting there. Like, it was actually, I remember, I remember it fondly. Like, yeah, I wanted to work on a feature with the director of photography for, for a long time. So we would shoot tests. Um, if I could ever save up enough bucks to just be, uh, let, we're just going to go do it. And I'm the producer, I'm the studio, I'm everything let's just see what we can do with these old film stocks for a couple of days. And there's no pressure. We get what we get. And that means you got to get clue Gulliger to show up, rile him up, get John in there. <laughs> like all those folks. <laughs> it was neat to experiment and play. It'd be like, you could work out all the kinks of different languages and then develop a shorthand with this, this key asset to a production. And then, so when that movie happened, if it hadn't have been for all those, and we were just getting to know, you know, you, you, you really find that you've built a speed rail when you just thought you're spending a couple weekends together experimenting. Let's start from the beginning a little bit. When I first discovered you guys, obviously it was on project green light. Um, I can, I immediately fell in love with you two guys. Cause I'm like, these are my guys. These are, this is me. I'm these guys. And I'm watching you guys try to live the horror fan dream of getting your, your script made. And, and, and that's another thing I'm dying to go back and revisit that series, but you cannot find that season anywhere. And why is it, what is going um, on with that particular season? It was a, well, it, that was in the Disney Weinstein separation. So yeah, Disney Weinstein, and I don't know if Bravo or Bravo fit in, but really that was just kind of a thing about the rights. So when they were, cause I thought, well, what Shirley is going to bring back, some version to download or watch season three would would have been the return to hbo was it for Greenlight season four yeah but no so i i think um it just must be caught up in the gum then yeah it was a is a right thing because I, I remember that's because you asked like when the fourth one came out they didn't they didn't have any footage from the second one disney had it and then miramax and then it was just stuck in some weird purgatory of bankruptcy and that what's a new company called it's not spyglass but spyglass absorbed it something i don't know it was something wrapped up in the rights and then they couldn't quite clear it so that's what that's what happened i that one also you could get on youtube i downloaded it all but so it may not be there anymore someone put it on youtube at some point like and it had everything like all this extra stuff and i ended up grabbing it and i so i i have it you know i should upload it somewhere because no one would care at all but <laughs> it's it, it has such like a early 2000 sheen to it and you forget that there was that sheen to it and then you see it and you remember like the horror channel remember the horror channel oh, back in the day the horror channel yeah <laughs> i remember <laughs> the horror channel thing is such a disappointment because it could have been huge they had the name they had everybody yeah. behind them and they just had somebody running it who didn't make good decisions yeah so yeah. <clears throat> but oh well you know, now we have Shutter. Yeah, Shutter. Shutter's felt like probably what it, I mean. Well, so many of these things, even like Project Greenlight, the first version, were just ahead of their time in terms of technology. You know, and then you see, uh, like I just watched the last blockbuster documentary, yeah, and it's funny because, it, well, interesting, right? And the guy was like, "Well, actually, we had yeah. we had <laughs> it like we were going to be Netflix, and then 
the thing hit and we just didn't have any money. And so they did. And so they became Netflix and we just didn't. <laughs> and they yeah. just, yeah, they had the idea and that it just didn't, didn't when they were to do it, you know. So, I had a flashback, like right in the middle of watching it, they showed, um, I worked up one, the Panga by the motion picture television fund. So I'd do day shifts out there and then I could make it to the 6 p.m. to close shift uh, at Blockbuster. And on Saturday mornings, however, like 8 a.m. or so, and they could get me in there to unload the box. And so that was like, usually it was kind of fun, it, or at least like at that early morning, at least it was robotic, until someone shoved a full diaper into their unsatisfactory <laughs> copy of Free Willy. And so uh. that's when he opened <laughs> whoa, ah, oh, come on, you know? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so you worked at Blockbuster? I sure did, yeah. And it was, you could tell they were going down. He was, like, Marcus was working at, like, not, not like a long time ago. Like, Why does it say Jamie? Recent. It was uh, not the biggest budgeted blockbuster, uh, as it was it was starting to fight to, to hang in there. And it so, was like, I, you're going to be Jamie. I was Jamie. And at the same time, <laughs> okay, fine. He, this is, like, not long before... We won Project Green Light. I, I handed out the. Like that's 2004, 2003, 2004. Because I handed out the sneak screening passes to, ironically, uh, Shaker uh, High, because it was test screening at a theater uh, in Calabasas. So someone would show up with a big smile and say, Hey, if you see anybody and want to ask them as they're checking out if they want to see a movie tonight, here you go. And so it was kind of cool. We would restock season one uh, and then. You know, it, it was it was cool. And every now and again, you'd see actors, you'd see musicians who come in, you know, folks that are hiding out there. It really was neat. That that documentary brought back a lot of all good memories. Yeah. You know, it did feel like you were with a cool cabal of, uh, of film lovers. And then just every now and again, someone comes in, puffing up their chest, flipping out because Rain of Fire was scratched. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, it's funny as I watched it and I enjoyed it. And I related to obviously the cinephiles, but I was never a blockbuster guy. I mean, I'd been in a couple, but I mm -hmm. always rented from the mom pa shops. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. I just never, I never, when they started to die, I was already had so much in my own collection that I wasn't really renting anymore. I was just buying physical media constantly. So I couldn't really relate to the whole love of blockbuster but I related to the love of the video store, you know? I mean, that's true. You know, my nostalgia goes back to the mom and pop store in Evanston where I went, where I grew up. Mm. And it definitely had a different vibe than Blockbuster. Blockbuster is very sterile and they're trying to sell you candy and popcorn as much as anything else, right? Like mm. by, while the mom and pop one was, they only had two copies of something. So you had to be very strategic about how, how you got it. And that actually, that led me to renting weird stuff. Mm -hmm. Because they didn't have that. They didn't have the new releases, you know? Well, that was so the thing, like in the documentary, how Lloyd Kaufman was saying they wouldn't carry his stuff. And it's yeah. that was probably another reason I didn't go to Blockbuster, because I was looking for the weird stuff, you know? Yeah. I appreciated that anomaly they had where if it was a mom and pop store that was yeah. the branded Blockbuster, you could sneak them in there. Because I know I was thrilled with ours because we had letterboxed, unrated, uncut Suspiria. So I thought like, hey. This is a rule breaker right here. So, you know, great employee picks for Jamie going up hot. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie. <laughs> Jamie. So you guys win Project Greenlight. And how did that completely change your lives? I mean, obviously, you know, you made your first feature. Your, your face is out there. People are recognizing you. What was that like for you guys? I think for both of us, it was almost too late. And that's what made it sweet. Mm -hmm. Like. There's only so because we were not 19, 20. This was I didn't want to be cobbling together a living from uh, the retirement home, the video store and whatnot. I wanted to be contributing to, to that industry in a, in a more viable way. And so then, thank goodness, uh, Patrick's wife, even was listening to the radio when they had a, a radio announcement. Imagine doing that today, listening to the radio and hearing my Project Greenlight season three is entertaining the idea of exploring other genres such as comedy action or horror and we're like hey what about that idea you know and, mm -hmm. and that that's what was neat so we were certain our our uh, our screenplay our initial screenplay was perfect for their million dollars and then they, they told us at the the announcement that 
we ran a budget. It's uh, $25 million. So we're going to need you to cut some things. Like, oh, so, do you remember? I don't, I don't know if you remember, Marcus, but because we were going to make a short film mm -hmm. based on the idea that was the collector. And like, we wanted to raise some money. I think it's like 25,000, and Marcus was going to direct it. And we were kind of in the middle of that. It never happened. When Project Greenlight came along, when I mentioned to Marcus, oh, my wife said they heard this, and it's Project Greenlight season three, and they wanted to do a horror movie, his brain instantly went to the collector and i was like no no, no the other one the, the feast which was what we we wrote that we wrote that in like 99 and then kind of returned to it and rewrote it and stuff as we went along and then that was the one that we eventually um sold and it was yeah it was game changer. i was reading scripts and marcus was working a blockbuster <laughs> and um and and at the same time it actually helped kind of define what where we should be going as storytellers and what we wanted to do because it was you know it's horror and so once you get introduced as horror that's what you have to do mm -hmm. well which is fine for us that's what, you know, some people get pigeonholed they don't like it but there's so much you can do within horror that we completely embraced it you know like well, there's so fine. many different subgenres. even just the other day you know like when you talk to someone i was like oh gee we never did we never have done like a vampire one you know, we've never, or, or zombie one, or, and there's, and there's so much you can, you can do. It's a great space to live in too, you know, because you can, you can, you don't have to rely upon stars. It's really based on ideas and filmmaking over, over the dependence on selling, you know. Well, and not to mention that if we were to say right now, we want to make an unrated NC-17 horror comedy with, extremely foul natured people and you know it, you know it starts blue and just keeps going darker mm -hmm. um but it's funny and it's got a heart you know that yeah okay there's maybe four people that can make that happen and really punch it through whereas uh, that was that's what was unique is that was somehow embraced as the like, granite door of, of that hope was closing so all we wanted to do was throw our love for evil dead to brain dead in a blender and see what could happen in the uh, the Joe Dante segment of Twilight Zone, the movie. Just so like, can't forget that we need something random every now and again that just makes you go, what? Yeah. You know, <laughs> like yeah. that's the fun part. The, the tricky part though is it was to keep it going after mm -hmm. that, you know, and not not to just look at that as the end all be all, but is to have things going so that we have a continual career. That was the hardest part. Well, so yeah. what did happen like right after Feast happened? Like when, what was oh, your uh, next step? A lot of no's. No. Concurrent to Feast, <laughs> he wrote the Highlander movie, yeah. uh, and that was mostly to keep the rights at Dimension, and then they were going to try to uh, shoot a little bit, but that, for whatever reason, I think went the way of the dodo, and then we would pick up odd things along the way, because this movie, it just wasn't coming out. 18 months, it was in post because of the Weinstein-Disney separation, it just took time, so then, I think I still have the old Variety paper, Remember Papers, um where there was that little thing on the front like the weinsteins are taking clerks too uh i think something awesome something awesome something awesome and feast and we're like oh my god <laughs> we're gonna live you know and then about gosh six weeks later we're at a little premiere and by that point we'd shot a presentation for the collector it had been set up the neighbor was also done Melton like uh, cranked out a draft of that in so quickly, but it was just, you know, like burning out of him. By the time 18 months later happened, I think everything well, was ready to well, put although, our best. Although one thing, I mean, Feast, Fe the Feast is a horror comedy, you know, right? And gore, and that was not in at all. A few films later came along that were probably a bit more slick uh, studio type, type stuff that brought that back. Like now might've been a better time to come out with it. But back then, because right when it came out, it was when like the hostels and and the saw came out and everything just changed in that direction. Right. Like this is at the tail end of like the Japanese um, horror remake type stuff. Remakes, yeah. Right. And then this and then that was the new turn was that I don't even know how I don't want to say torture porn, but I guess that defines it. But like that kind of horror, like it was Wolf Creek and stuff like that. That was our telltale moment. Uh, so we had to pivot to with yeah. that, yeah. you know, and then that was and that was the neighbor because we because uh, we had the collector, the collector we had written and we were moving that along and Marcus was going to direct it and blah, blah, blah. And he'd done the test. I don't know if you ever saw a test it was really cool with the Gulagers. And um, 
but we couldn't sell it because it was like we had already been sold. <laughs> so we needed something that was like, oh, new that was untouched and anything. And so that's when in like a panic move in a week, and it was a July 4th long weekend where I wrote The Neighbor. And that was the thing that got us looked at differently. If I may brag about you, it also got us into the Writers Guild. And, mm -hmm. and if you don't pounce on that opportunity, like by comparison, I'm four and four and eight days in on uh, up for movies, like uh, up to five movies. But it took 11 years to finally get into the union. And that was Blumhouse. And it was because it was just a point of fact. If you're doing something there, it's in there. I was like, really? I don't have to beg for this? Like, yeah. oh, yeah. Like, it, that was really cool. So Patrick's ingenuity and drive allowed us to have that bedrock and learn a hell of a lot. and Go, go, go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, and then we just got lucky with a lot of things getting made well some people made you know look back on dimension and even screen gems when they were doing the dvd stuff and make fun of it but people don't realize that they would make one theatrical to like seven straight to dvd movies and they had great budgets i mean people would 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 give the first child for the budgets those movies are given now like mm -hmm. you know there's seven million they, they routinely make a seven million dollar straight to dvd movie well now you're lucky to get five million for what's supposed to be a theatrical and that's just hard to do and this is you know 20 years ago but 15 years ago a lot of stuff was getting made and we just came along at a good time where a lot of stuff got made and so it was good but it was um you know it was the hard part was just keeping up and not getting caught up in the moment and just doing stuff and having a good attitude and kind of keeping keeping things going so it resulted in a lot of stuff in a short amount of time and um the but it was like the neighbor and the collect the neighbor and then the test that marcus did for the collector that that's what got us a lot of attention and that's what got us the saw stuff and got put a, put us on their ra uh, radar and it was this guy carl mazicone he used to be there not there anymore but he uh he saw the neighbor stuff and thought they might come in at some point and then you know yeah we hit it off and they're like hey you know lee's not coming back for the for the fourth one and then once we got saw like that became a whole bigger thing just because you know pe people forget how like it was such a big deal oh yeah those movies well, I mean, that, again you had a, a looming strike you had a financial crash and then for some reason these really vicious horror movies with a very you know angry mechanism to them although an existential soil of enhancing gratitude i, I thought it was kind of like this is dr fives for a modern audience cannot be punished for their anger but rewarded for their virtue but they're angry you know and and that 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 was just a phenomenal thing and then for us it was a uh, my mom could know that maybe that movie would make it to Macomb, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And it did. You know, and that was really cool. Where <laughs> Feast did play there because of Matt Stein doing us a huge solid. It played uh, two nights at midnight in Macomb. And that was just awesome. I, it was the theater I worked at, so it was cool. You can climb up there and put F-E-A-S-T, like, ah! And then, you know, it's, it's, it's a town shut down by 11, but hey! <laughs> it's cool. It's cool because it was, uh, like, it was some of it was because they were yearly, and they came out every... Mm -hmm. Halloween, everyone's terrified not to make it because it was working that we can't take time off. And it just became this thing where I'll run into people now, kids now, and I'll say like, they're like, oh, you write stuff? And I'll do like my tattoos and stuff. And they're like, oh, you know this one? You know, this one. Uh, and they're like, oh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, and their eyes light up and then they, and they, and nine out of 10 times, they'll tell you like, oh my God, like me and my cousin used to go to those every Halloween. And it was like, didn't matter if they, if they were good or bad. They were just because it became like this, like a family and or friend event to go see it. And that's what just what they did. And like that, it was cool that that happened because it's so you can't replicate that. Everyone tries to replicate that, but it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And even even with like the release of the the new the new ones, like, well, they're not coming out on Halloween, you know, and that was that was such a that everyone can say from that era. That, like they know the line. If it's Halloween, it's got to be saw. Like everyone know, knew that. I've been movies to the month. Yeah. Seven in a row. That's like that's yeah. crazy, and it could have been more, but yeah. <laughs> have you guys <laughs> ever been approached to come back to to the to the series since they're still trying to kind of keep it going? We have directly and indirectly participated along the way because that's the yeah. one thing that also I, I think can never be overstated is how familial that is, and so you're happy for the folks that are coming in. You're thrilled because it's like you're sharing this this moment of of a campfire 
story and you get to the next person gets to tell the tale. And like the, the coolest thing is, I don't know, if Lee would ever remember this, but Melton and I, we were in the running. So I had that old brick iPod and I was just listening to Hello Zep over and over, walking to the grocery store to put something together. Mm-hmm. And on my way back, right at the dun, dun, there's Lee Winnell at uh, Daily Planet reading a magazine, I'm like, Ooh! you know, Ooh! yeah, <laughs> yeah! <laughs> you know what I mean? it was just kind of cool. And then like later, you know, you just don't want to sully their genius. You want to hopefully just not piss anybody off, give some folks a good scare and do your damnedest to make it so. I and mean, they've said it, like, if you guys have any ideas, just let us know. It's interesting having watching it 10 years removed and there was so fucking hard to write like because there's so much stuff going on there's like it's like first you have to make a great story and then what kind of stories i was in a group game or a nut game and then the time and then all the time time shift stuff and then all the canon and then oh by the way john cream has been dead for every single movie that we have to do and then (laughs) it's like and then there's one and it's funny watching it removed from it i think it was in part three I'm like, God, John Kramer fucking hates that police department. <laughs> it's just like yeah. fucking torturing in all of them. I'm like, what did they really do? That he's so mad at them and testing them all. Like, Jesus Christ. Um, you get back into like the, the, the mind space of it and how complicated it is because like, A, like everything's been done before. All the twists have been done before. And it's like, and then it always boils down to like, well, what do you do with John Kramer? Is he in it? How is he in it? Tobin's kind of old now, but like, what does that mean? And then like, and then it's like, are you doing another apprentice? Uh, are you doing a copycat? Uh, like what? And then, <laughs> and then, and then your mind starts even, you know, falling back even more thinking back to the soft space Remember that website when we were active on it. And you, and then you're remembering like, cause people would have their own little, little saw stories. And there's always little good little nuggets in there. And then, but then now people would shit on like, you're like, oh, that was a good idea. And then you keep reading and it's like, oh, that was a terrible idea because X, Y, and Z and blah, blah, blah. And you're like, and then your brain just really blows up and you fall asleep well, in, and, and, in a fetal position of life. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, like, you just got to hang out with the guy for one second to realize he is still a masterful kickboxing possessor of the actual fountain of youth. So his imprint in our mind as the jigsaw, John Kramer, is frailty. But no, he's still mighty and, and and you know anything has the elixir of life mm. even in um i haven't seen spiral yet but in jigsaw he looked he looked great like a sensei almost he was like i work with him so i see him quite often he swims every day he's yeah like he's re- like whenever we we do a convention it's like you know sean you got to make sure they have a pool because i want to <laughs> be able to swim <laughs> like yeah he is an actor's actor there's, there's, there's not that many, but he is so professional, so on time. And, and he's, a, he's the kind of actor just, he doesn't just say the words, he makes them better. And so like, like we've had on, on Soft Space, they're on Twitter now, and they ask us to answer questions. It's always like, what's your favorite line? And it, every time it's a line that I don't remember either of us writing, and it's just that Tobin just did. Yep. And it was like, even like the one, it was, what was it? Um, like, it's like, it's in, in a killing's distasteful. To me, like the way he said it, it's yeah. like, and I'm sure we just wrote Killian as a safe for me, but he's just like, you know, mm-hmm. it has that like that little pause that makes it memorable. And same thing with the piranha. Like, remember that in six? Oh, We're just so, like talking, and he goes, piranha. Captain <laughs> like, Crater yeah. was certain that would be the thing that, that he couldn't get in the Saw 6 budget. But Dan Hefner delivered uh this piranha in a tank and and then and then we we're like well that's really cool good ray kevin he's like just wait and then you see tobin's face come in piranha piranha <laughs> like, but it's like ah! it's like mid speech and you're like what yeah yeah <laughs> and, and like that's and that because that kind of speaks to uh the heart and genius and all the passion putting in because i think the secret storytelling of any saw film is Kevin Breuder. And so if it's about an architect, an engineer who's dealing with fate, Kevin literally is the architect of every movie's fate. But he has to come up with that pattern of stimulus to keep us on track with all these plot threads. So you can 
it, it's I just think it's marvelous. But uh, uh, Casas was really good too. Like I'm, this is all fresh in my mind because I literally just watched. But Casas, Casas had he always had like the hardest lines because they were all like kind of exposition-y but kind of also tipping his hand a little bit like he had the toughest dialogue and he he did it all very well like i really i really was impressed by his performance after watching it because he had the hardest lines like just the dumbest lines and he would just like say it with such conviction and his voice and gravitas that it just worked you know like he just had it looking like he meant it when he said it um I keep randomly running into him at this one grocery store. Yeah, he's just, yeah. And I'll just turn around and be like, hey, I died. Yeah, and like sweatpants and like a, like a oh, vest. Dude, <laughs> dude I, but, I, but I love him. Really I love him. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's, really he's dive in. he'll just um, call me up randomly like, Sean, hey, hey, man, how's it going, bro? Hey, yeah. you're the man. How's it going, buddy? You know, it is, it's always complimenting you and like he's yeah. like, like he's in the middle of something. And he yeah. just like he's just got five seconds to talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's he's oh. awesome. I love I love that guy. He's he's a great guy. And and he's very uh, forthcoming about um, all moments of life because like he was like I'm sure you get hammered with this all the time, but can you tell me about that scene, uh, the scene in the pledge, for Sean? Oh yeah, I gave that everything. I <laughs> like, the pledge is just this murderer's row of every actor's version of their finest moments. You know, and it was that one thing. So the, I, you know, like personally, I was always like, I wonder if we've got a pledgeish moment for him. And sure enough, uh, courtesy of Twitter and Patrick and you know, I speaking about it, that nine minute scene between Tobin and Costas just going at it. And the whole thing is like, he's bound. Mm-hmm. He can't use any of that godlike strength. And it all has to be in the performance. I'm like, there it is. He's actually looking like he's about to burst into tears. And he's so angry, like he's the anger, you know, he's the person that doesn't know how to express his justice, but knows at least the kill gets most of it done. Yeah. He's yeah. a great actor, an underrated actor. I agree. Yeah. He is. Well, we should probably jump into some of these questions because because sure. they'll probably yeah. open up other topics. Um, let me start with uh, Daniel Caruso wanted to know. How hard was it for you guys to be able to keep the bloody mayhem and violence in the Feast trilogy? How hard was it? Pretty easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were all for it. Well, well yeah. yeah. Uh, Cooler, it's, yeah. Yes. No, you had like an absolute streamlined element of collaboration. The, the, the tough part was that damn writer's strike and that Feast 2 had a to the penny budget of $5 million. And then all of a sudden it became... Sorry, guys, piece two and three have to be done both for a sum total of about three. So then the 30 day schedule becomes 15 or 16 for both. And it, and, and the way it was produced was interesting because they would be like, you know, they just they fully trusted John and everybody to be like, we're going to put the camera on your shoulder. We're going to give you everything you need. You'll have full access to everything we can do for this amount of time so we can maximize this amount of days. And so it wasn't almost like a structured you got to get to this scene by noon it was a it was just keep going if you all of a sudden have a 10 page day great then tomorrow if it's three pages because it's a a big violence wow uh and that was interesting you know to to be a part of but it's it's one of those things where it would be nice to to still finish it you know the third the third screenplay as written was never made the second one was cut in half kind of stretched out kind of things at the end um, but it, it maintained, I, I do feel like this bumper sticker charm of the first folks abandoned by FEMA, the last folks that were ever going to get a, a break in life or the folks that were broken, just thinking like, well, this is it dealing with monsters. And I thought that's fun. Like the, this thing that can come la- level the playing field with just an audacity and savagery. Okay. And it also becomes a, a Gulager family story mm-hmm. where you've got Tom's actual little boy and easily, I think the most offensive scene we've ever been part of, where uh, Greg Swank, a.k.a. Sniff, saves a child in order to look badass in front of all the people that just think he's a sleazy adulterer. He's running with the baby. John Gulliger is playing a very uh, spot on rendition of the Barry Lyndon theme, watching his brother carry his bro- baby. And then, sorry, baby. To- oh. <laughs> 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 yeah, that. Those days on that set, my. And doesn't God. a monster then like all oh, jump on through it, grab him in the All air. devastating injury. Oh, that's right. And 
bite, then some of it's barfed, I think. And that may have been cut out. So it, the baby was, it was just like, oh, like every character needed to see their proof that that didn't just happen. Oh, it happened. Yeah, that happened. Oh. So do you think there's ever a chance that another one could be made or is it tied up in that dimension stuff or uh that one is dimension so so who, would, who is it it's i think spyglass owns it now well I think I, there's no way they'd be interested in that no but you know what in the era of streaming and in the era of, of needing product if the way we were able to get through was this absolute tiny window of opportunity influence and, and just pure luck yeah. then yeah well, so Spyglass owns it, probably has zero knowledge that they own it. <laughs> we had a really cool idea that you could make for a budget that had it like, like let's say, I'm going to say this on the air because it's actually a really good idea. It just came to me. But like, if we did like a <laughs> series for Shutter, like Shutter, Shutter, okay, Shutter, like a series for Shutter. Yes, yes, like Shutter hey, presents. Hey. Or shutter. Yes, yes. Like shutter. Like shutter. And it was a series and like and it, whatever it you know, it was in the feast world and it was the series version, blah blah blah. And we could make it for X amount of dollars and blah blah blah. Then I'm sure they would be they would be more than happy to talk about that. Oh uh, I, I can't wait to see it. Yeah, I've always been saying, Tommy, how'd you get your big break? <laughs> oh. anyway, I can't wait to fire you from the show now. Oh, uh, well, like yeah. Marcus, we need to talk. Yeah. <laughs> we saw the dailies. And although you had nothing to do with them, craft services completely. <laughs> Can I talk about that? Here's what I loved about the development process with Feast is that we were well aware, as, as I think we'd both seen uh, from dusk till dawn, opening weekend, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, my, uh, the, my family's gold Toyota minivan that they let me drive to Iowa was parked next to the, the house we were in. And so the heater could keep enough ice off the door that I could open it and, and make a late movie. And so I drove and saw that. And so when Feast was there, like the, the cosmetics of Monsters Bar, folks inside with uh, wild backstories or, or, or very flippant attitudes, Bob Weinstein did not leave a single stone unturned. Uh, we were in the room when Robert Rodriguez gave us permission to tell a story of Monsters in a Bar because he was well aware of its differences and was complimented by its uh, likenesses. And that was that was neat. And you don't think like when they're playing with pieces that big, these are the guys making the huge stuff. Mm -hmm. And we were, you know, just the bastards trying to get in the door. That was really neat. Uh, in, in that ribald, vulgar world of those movies, those characters, those situations, they, they, they were shown affection. Butch Vaughn. <laughs> wants to know what two characters would you guys have battle each other if you could make the next Freddy versus Jason or King Kong versus Godzilla type movie? Oh, wow. These are the fun questions. <laughs> I, you know, there's something about... All right. Thomas Ripley and Patrick Bateman. Who's Thomas Ripley? Ripley, uh, well, you know, Matt Damon played him in uh, The Talented Mr. Ripley. Oh, Just shit. This guy I've never who, seen that movie. <laughs> well, it, it's it's like, it, it's it's so good and, ha and is punctuated by violence, but Patrick Bateman is someone who's not, you know, movie Patrick Bateman, not book Patrick Bateman. Yeah, yeah. But movie Patrick Bateman was wondering at the end if he was losing himself, if he was ever, there was a navigation on who he was and if his his split mind was real or not. And with Ripley, it's someone like, I'm fascinated with your life. I'll just take it. And to have those two intersect, I think, would be neat because they'd probably both be trying to absorb each other. And the fight would actually be to realize who they are. And maybe it would end with a handshake and be like, well, that was close. And to them know? making love. Yeah. <laughs> one, one of the first things I ever wrote when I was in, the, I think it was in seventh grade. Seventh grade. And I was at my grandparents' house. And I was so bored because that was when like you had three channels on TV and I tried to write my first screenplay and it was a battle royale. I was into wrestling. I was really into wrestling. I loved wrestling. And then the battle royale back then was like so much fun, right? When it was like, they'd all show up and a big fight. And I wanted to do a battle royale with all the horror supervillains. 
And that was going to be the movie. And I wrote like seven pages of it, but it was, it was, it was written on like yellow, the yellow paper mm-hmm. and hand, hand, handwritten. <laughs> and then I got to a point where I didn't know what, how to do that. And I, it's funny, just the other day, I actually thought about that. I was like, how could you, could you do that now with like the rights? And I was like, and then that just got too complicated. So it left my brain and I thought more about cake or whatever. I think the correct answer is probably it just shouldn't be done. Period. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, because yeah. pumpkin head versus uh, mm. Luther the Geek. Who? Luther the Geek, very underserved for us. <laughs> pumpkin head versus leprechaun versus. Oh, you know, lepre- who's the who's the the the, the boy? What's the name? The baghead from. Uh, oh, Sam from Trick or Treat. Yeah, Sam. Sam versus leprechaun. Or Chucky versus Leprechaun, you know? I mean, Jesse yeah. Drachman wants to know what was the inspiration behind the collector character? Oh my gosh. Um, I think that goes back to in my head, I, I know I wanted to do a rated R story that was like a rated R Twilight Zone about the thief who gets stolen. You know, just there it is. Mm-hmm. And then the more you get to know Josh, and we're like taking detail away from this cipher of evil. And it became this person with a uh, moral needle in a fight with his shadow. Sometimes the shadow's bigger and overwhelms. And sometimes the last of that good is like, well, the one thing the shadow didn't count on is I give a shit about some people. And you just cross the line. So, yeah, well, I, that, I mean, a lot of it for us, too, was like thinking about things we didn't like of other movies and doing the reverse of that. Like like this, this instinct of like, oh, let's take off his mask and get to know him and really understand where he came from and what he hurts, what he feels. And we're like, no, actually, we we are more of the Michael Myers types where it's like he's evil and you just don't want to get across this guy. And so we were trying to convey that, you know, like of him, him being this this evil entity that crosses these people and either you either you live or you don't and as we sort of developed them more we brought out the whole the bug thing and the the spider the fly right 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 and so it's, was ever watching <laughs> ever patient ever delicate ever ornate and yeah. then barkin is this fly you could run around and so adding the web imagery and well that, that was fun yeah uh, and this distaste for like humans and human behavior mm-hmm. and how you like if you really were able to deconstruct him he just um felt more for the the bugs and the, than the actual humans he was working for um but then the, this that the a lot of it were wasn't necessarily based on the specific person who, or behavior it was like the, also with that movie was the idea of how we so easily allow anyone into our homes just because we're wearing a uniform and we don't when we without asking any questions really at all and so with that movie the first movie it was a bit more focused on the high concept of it all of like um of that and then and then the idea of mr bad meaning mr worse so like the moral dilemma that a bad guy faces when trying to steal from someone what does he do in that moment you know um because keep in mind when we wrote this mm-hmm. and we were doing it it was a different time in horror history where it was saw and hostile these people put in these tough situations and how do they react with that you know we always presented it as a crime drama of this guy who needs to get this thing by a certain amount of time or his family's going to get harmed and he's got it oh which shit then he runs into this bigger problem which like there's this killer in this basement that's killing these innocent people and do i help them or do i not help them if i don't help them i can save my family but am i can i live with myself not helping them and so he makes that choice and he tries to help him and then he's stuck in the box and learns that life in the box is pretty tough till part two when he's the game. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's funny because we've had conversations about like doing a tv show or other stuff and it's funny how people who i don't think have the most exposure to horror movies in the history of horror movies where you think oh for the series we're going to really get to know that killer but that can be a bit of a trap, I think, where, you know, once you take the mask off your killer, I'm not sure what you're left with. It's all, I have, my head always goes back to um, eight millimeter when he takes off, remember in the end, when he takes off the mask and this is pudgy guy with glasses. And he's like, what did you expect the monster? And you're like, mm. I mean, it, it was very effective. 
but you're like yeah that's not that guy's not fucking scary at all obviously the scariest thing is what's going to be in your own mind sure yeah 100 percent. uh you know that was my biggest problem with the rob zombie halloween remakes was he exactly he totally demystified the character he made him human he wasn't the boogeyman anymore he wasn't this what is he it yeah. was like no abused kid grew up shitty childhood yeah uh, go for it you know i was yeah. like i i could i couldn't get behind that you know yeah well and, and the thing is that could have been it that didn't have to be called halloween yeah and probably if it wasn't called halloween it probably wouldn't have been criticized nearly as much either. oh yeah so you'd have been like oh yeah that's fucking oh, cool right that's why i think i thank the stars for halloween too rob zombies halloween too was seemed to be like the, the art house inside this 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 artist exploded it was coming from a place that was entirely personal and didn't need our input the um and he even said that i'm sure he said it in other interviews too but he like because we were at dimension when he was doing part two and we we helped out on a little bit just in, like conversational with him and 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 he you know and he was like he was really excited about getting past the first one so that he could do his own sort of thing and not be so um you know, uh, forced to deal with canon and all that. And so, and, and there was this one, tr- the one trailer for the the second one, it was, it was to Knights of White Stanton. Yeah. It's, it's one of the best yeah. four, it's one of the best four oh. trailers I've ever seen. I, it's Have still, you seen it, Sean? It's three on my dog on, uh, as a song. Oh, right? it, it was never released because they couldn't get the rights. It was oh, accidentally so bloody disgusted. I don't it think was, I, I don't think I ever saw it. It might be yeah. online, but it, it was just like oh, it and, be on. It's and it was so good. I think we agree where it's like that that's a trap for a lot of people of saying, Oh, let's get to know them on a personal level and see what makes them tick. Because once you have that, you're left well, I'm not sure what you're left with. Like it's so not particularly I, scary. So do you guys like Rob's second film? I do. I saw it four times. So I, I it's my least favorite in the franchise. I even put resurrection over it. I got to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's... <Didn't have> <laughs> um, I, I, I liked parts of it. I liked, I liked ideas of it. Um, again, I felt a little bit hamstrung by just the, the canon of it all. You can't say the first 15 minutes weren't really good. No, that was that was one of my biggest problems with it. I was like, just... this is great. This is kicking ass. Whoa, that was just a dream. Really? Did you just yeah. do that? Really? Yeah. That's where he lost me immediately right there. I know. And, then, and then it takes a while to get going again. Right. Yeah. It's like you know, rebuild. It's a year later. He's been eating the hound dogs or whatever it is. And then, <laughs> I mean, but keep in mind, it's like he was, he, he was also worked over by Bob Weinstein. And it's like, and we were in the middle of that, like where he, you know, he would, Bob would come up to us and tell us stuff. And then we had to like, convey it to rob and it was just like and at the end of it was like like because rob will tell you what he wants to do and you're like that's fucking good let's let him fucking do it yeah you know and um and he had the right idea i mean he was doing it was his frankenstein story right and, yeah. but it just like but sometimes when you say like i mean we we're dealing with bob weinstein on like like um hellraiser like he just never understood what hellraiser was and and you try to explain it he doesn't care and so he'll just kind of try to jam shit in there and that was our concern when we were doing Halloween Returns. Uh, we had a pretty clear vision of what it should have been. And he just wanted specific things in it. Like he just wanted, he wanted Michael Myers in a electric chair for the poster. And for a moment he was like, I just want that. And if you guys can figure out how to get to that and then get out of that, do whatever you fucking want. And um, we did. And then, but then there got to a point where like, um, and this always happens with dimension. It gets to a point where it starts going sideways with some weird finances or favors that we need to do. And then, you know, eventually he, he lost the rights. And, but it was like, and so we kind of knew, I mean, you know, we had, there's that script that's online that people like, and we've had done podcasts on it and stuff like that. But, you know, I don't know if that would have been, we would have been able to make that. It would have been great if we would have the end result of, Malik and Jody and Danny McBride and Blum is they've been able to really just do the version they want to do. Um, and they, they seem not to be fucked with too much, which is, which is good that at least like we can get back. Like we saw, I saw the new mo- new one and it just, it's tone and mm-hmm. it's feel like, okay, at least this feels like we're back where we should be. If you don't know Halloween 
And don't tell me kids don't know it and we're trying to lure them in again. Just like, fuck off. Like, just, if you don't know it, then I don't fucking care. Like, go watch, go watch the, go watch it, the shit you need to know and then watch it. It's not my fucking job to, to teach you the history of it, you know? And so it feels like they're kind of able to just do that without the bullshit. Well, and like David Gordon Green, he, my mom saw that movie. And she had only had seen the first one. And, and then it was, a, it was a complete experience, you know? And that, that's what was neat is it had, and it had the author's stamp of approval. It was yeah. neat that I could go, uh, I, I saw the, the John Carpenter concert where he plays that theme and he's next to his son. Mm-hmm. And this entire room is just, he's a rock guy. And then at the end of it, he, he gets to the end of it and he just went, yeah. and you're like, oh! that's 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 the jazz right there it, it, it's just marvelous so yeah. it's, it's good hands and i i'm eager to see halloween kills i'm eager to see halloween ends you know like come me, on yeah me too because like able to do stuff that we wanted to do and talked about doing but we had, we would have to hide it like we had all this stuff in there that was from halloween 2 and halloween 3 and we knew that the dimension people didn't know what it meant or what we were doing and we were just sort of holding our breath that we'd still be able to do it. Even with like the soundtrack stuff, if you read the screenplay, there was all these references to like particular cues and all that. And it was all from that. And, we, and so we're hoping, like hoping, I hope we can get it. But like when you're dealing with dimension, you can't. While I think with Blum, he's a bit more of a, um, even that group there's more of, you know, purist. And they, they'll slowly be like, oh, we want to get this, image we want to get the masks from halloween 3 because yes 99 percent of the audience won't have any, any fucking clue but that one percent will be like nice and they'll be like yeah let's do that and then he'll be able to call up universal and be like we need this blah 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 and i'll do it i think universal's involvement has helped a lot because yeah. they obviously did two and three so yep. they're able to kind of pull from those a little more than yes you know yeah <clears throat> Um, yeah. But I do want to circle back to Halloween a, a, a minute. I want okay. to stick, stick with the collector okay, uh, yes. for the moment. Uh, got a few more questions on collector. Uh, Pose Nicholson said, my question for Marcus and Patrick is, what is the collector's mask supposed to be made of in the movies? Is it supposed to be similar to like a spider or something? It's what it kind of reminds me of. Love your movies, guys. Keep up the good work. Feast Trilogy is a blast. Oh, oh, it's just the tears, flesh, and um, meat of the of his victim. He just kind of mixes it together and it comes into like gel and just smears on his face. I don't know. Marcus can answer this. Uh, yeah, well, it, the, the journey of that mask was concocted by the great Gary Tonicliffe. And um, the fibering and whatnot is that spot on. I, I, I remember an image of the Vincent Price ending of the fly, you know, where you finally were so close to that insight of it oh my gosh the fibers and everything and then that spider coming i just thought we were so complacent and just functioning as it was about to slowly devour a man you know begging to not be taken like hmm so I, i'd say spot on let's say it's it's however you can get to the texture of a spider but is it an actual spider no i don't, I don't think that they would uh, he'd, he'd have a harvest that big you know to to make that but the the idea, yes. It was supposed to be imperfect, you know, like he mm-hmm. created this, he made it. And it it, you know, it was supposed to serve a purpose too, like where he's one that is a is a voyeur and he so that's why he's wearing all black and leaving no trace of himself behind and he becomes this entity and like like he's supposed to be hiding around the house while these people are walking through killing themselves and being tricked and blah blah blah. And and so it would makes sense for him to be covered in all black and mm-hmm. so that was it serves, it's supposed to serve a purpose as well you know but do you guys have an idea of what that mask is supposed to be made of is i guess that's what he's asking oh like literally oh, what is made I, of? We, I mean goodness it, it, we had different versions of its its different hides and skins and um it's an amalgamation of everything in the dark this person put together to represent he, who what he feels is his actual face mm-hmm. so like his face is his mask. That mask is his face. That's who he is. Mm-hmm. You know, this oddity. Melted Seven, that's screen name, Melted Seven said, here's a question for Marcus and Patrick. I know you guys kind of touched it on a little bit, but maybe you can elaborate. If you guys had the opportunity to, to make a franchise out of the collector, 
would you guys do it? Or was it always intended to end it with the collected? In other words, was it always intended to be a trilogy? We had hopes to to be able to visit it only as long as it was scary and, and had a purity to it. And, and also that it would allow us to stretch. Um, so it was almost like the first one from a directing standpoint, oh my gosh, I had the whole thing storyboarded, had everything scheduled to a T. And then the week before shooting, the budget's cut in half, the schedule's cut in half, and those boards are gone. You're just like in survival mode. So it, it really ingratiates you to the, the process the characters are going through. Like I was trying to survive as well. And then I got in, I was like, well, and then after a while you watch it and man, uh, I spent everything I made off Saw 4 and 5 writing to fund my own two weeks of shooting to get the first act made because that was good mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, out of the schedule. And so that that makes it very personal. But I also like the imprint that it made on the footage. We didn't have a huge set. We weren't back in the house. So it became eyes and details and wires. And the the, the beautiful benefit of that was there's just more texture to the whole thing. You're just closer. You're in on it. Uh, and that's what I enjoyed. So then the second one was like, my gosh, you know, this is a hell of a lot of money. Like, okay, well, let's 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 go for it. Then we can add some of the uh, the accoutrement of the the like what would be an action giallo movie with these characters, you know. So we're kind of doing something different. It's not well this time he's in an apartment building, you know, it, which would just been a, a repeat of beats with less uh, fleshed out characters, and then really get down to um, what is the what is this 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 woman's story who already felt like she'd lost too much, now finds out how much is left of her can be used to become quite the weapon and even save those who have abandoned her. Great. Um, and then with the third one, there was only one advantage to the third one and it's kind of nowness and that it's been so many years that we've graduated as humans from the characters of one and two where folks aspired. They wanted something. I will steal from my family. I will... I just want, and then for uh, Elena, it's like, I, I, I just, I want to feel complete and I want to feel love. And I want, I just want my dad to be able to move past the trauma as well. But now 10 years from now, it's like that now they've accumulated a life's worth of stuff, the family, the home, and there's that fear of it being taken away. So now they're the people who were in the house. And now that spider is still out there and he's only gotten bigger and more plump. And now he knows that they don't just bleed from one point. They have so many things they care for that can bleed. And that makes the world scary. Mm -hmm. I think that that's, that's the goal. As long as it can tell a graduation story. So what, what can you guys publicly share with what's going on with the third film? Well, we shot for eight days and then it was shut down. Um, and, you know, I, hey, I invested in this thing. I'd like to know what's happening. We stopped hearing from anybody with production. I know all my, uh, most of the props I brought there have been stolen. Uh, and I would think like anybody else who invested in this movie that thinks it's happening, wouldn't they like to know what's happening? Because I would. Yeah. I mean, we, we actually, we stopped, we stopped shooting in 2019. That was two years ago. And we only shot eight days. So we're not, we have very little really shot. Anything that's been released has been from that time period. Yeah. And um, there's no plans to start shooting it. I mean, we haven't talked to anyone who was in the production for months. All calls and emails have gone unanswered. So it's, it, we, we, we'd love to finish it, but like, sure. I don't know. It's not, we're not the producers, so we don't know. So basically it's in the producer's corner at this moment and, and they've kind yeah. of gone dark. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely dark. So I, and, and that's, you know, gosh, like, come on. You, you would think that if you shot for eight days, you kind of want to finish it. But when you hear nothing for so long, my yeah. God, God. So yeah, speaking we, of Halloween 3, it's like, I was finally working with Tom Atkins and he was bringing it. Mm -hmm. I want to finish a Tom Atkins role. I want my friend Josh, who's been there since the beginning. I want Emma Fitzpatrick, who's been there since the beginning. And this collector and like the new actors that have come in and Navi Rawat from Feast. Yeah. Everybody showed up to bring it. And our first week of shooting was all finale. So like, we know the intensity we were capturing. Is there a trailer or a teaser? Yeah, there's a teaser. It's been done for a long time. 
but it needs color time, music rights, and some VFX when you can't get anyone on the phone and you don't hear anything. So yeah. it's at this point, I'd say I'm really pissed off. Yeah, and the, well, the problem is too, it was um, two years ago. So people look different, like people change. Like remember we talked about how suddenly you one day you're gonna look old. It's like, like hairstyle change, just the face, like suddenly, mm -hmm. oh, I, I went on the uh, so-and-so diet. Like <laughs> you like you lost 20 pounds and now your face looks totally different. Like there's consistency problems. So I, I don't, I don't know. I think it's a real, it's in a real tough spot. Yeah, and again, if anybody truly responsible just sends an email, makes a phone call, okay. You know, yeah. even if you had to say, we absolutely have to wait until the pandemic is over, well, that makes sense. Then say that. But when you hear nothing, we're capable of imagining. It's what we do for a living. And then you just start to count the facts and the actions, yeah. like, this yeah. one may not go our way. Yeah. Well, that's uh, nonsense, too, because things are shooting. Things yeah. have been shooting yeah. everywhere for a year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you can figure it out. I mean, like, the, for example, I just watched the first episode of the new Mighty Ducks TV show on Disney Plus, and that was, like, that's got shut down. Uh -huh in the middle and then um they finished it and now it's on like it's not that you know of course they have money and resources but like yeah so now, I don't know. if if these people if these pro producers basically never rear their ugly heads again does that mean that that this is now tied up forever because of uh, or, or can you can you move on without them no it, it, it it's it's just it's it's only one producer outside of our of our legality at this point because that gets into rights. Um, yeah, he. Um, I mean, he, you couldn't start over with someone else, or you? No, no. no he 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 licensed the rights from uh, Liddell, Mickey Liddell, his company, and so he he holds them. Is there a time limit on that? No, oh. no, not that we know. No, it's a it's a pretty strong contract. Mm -hmm. so maybe at the end of the day he's the actual collector he's collected your franchise and now this is this is the real horror story so. yeah no that's you ain't kidding it's not that he doesn't want i, I mean the guy is a perfectly seems like a nice guy when you talk to him but and he, he just he's i think he's in a tough spot financially he just can't finish it so not, then, it's not that he doesn't, I don't think he doesn't want to, he just can't. Like, he's, yeah. thing, you know, he's doing other movies and probably this over here and that over there. So it's it's impossible for us, for us to really speculate what's going on in his head, but it's just, um, it's not getting done and we haven't talked to him in months. And so, yeah, and it, it's like, if you, to start, to start, we, we essentially have to start over. Yeah. And so that's, gosh, that's hard. I mean, you we have no stages, no sets, no nothing, no actors, no one hired. So you literally have to start over. Yeah. And we, we have it, like we have this footage, and we have, like we we have this teaser that if we put out, people would lose their mind. It's it's great, and it's just it's taken from the eight days we shot, and it, it's really cool. But um, then you're gonna try to match it with that, and blah blah blah. And people look different, so it's it's really hard. It's a, it's a really shitty position. Yeah. And it was all avoidable, completely avoidable. That's what drives me nuts. Like, I I didn't invest ten years getting this opportunity, uh, facilitating it, getting it together, pre-writing three different versions of this thing, just to be ignored. Wasn't my goal. And I'm assuming people who invested capital in this thing are probably wondering, like, hey, where's our movie? Yeah. You know. But you know, unfortunately. We gotta wait till uh, Thor's honesty hammer comes down and smacks them right, and then yeah. maybe we'll be back. Yeah. Rye guy said, "How did you first meet the fantastic and phenomenal Josh Stewart, and what were your initial thoughts on him? I think he's the one of the most underappreciated and overlooked actors in the business. Personally, FYI, I think your film The Neighbor is amazing and underrated in its own right as well." I, I love how Josh Stewart is your go-to guy and regular. I want to be Josh Stewart when I grow up. <laughs> I mean, that, that's it. And if you hear a little crinkling, it's because you want to know what it's like when you, when you really do know you found like a uh, friend in, in this professional jungle who gives life and limb. Because every day 
we're working together. Josh does one thing every single day. And it's his way of saying, hello, and how are you? And uh, he flips me off. <laughs> and that's that's my attaboy. One, one I, more time, Stuart, one more time. <laughs> um, also, like, look at a, a, an accomplished artist in that he he's directed. And he's directed beautiful films. Like Back Fork is a searing uh, example of the the epidemic of opioids and the and these beautiful rolling mountains. Um, and then you've got his he's also knows how to produce, not only act, but is a friend, father, and and, and just real just a genuine colleague. You want this guy in the foxhole and can carry these big moments. So the uh Man, I love seeing him and John Bernthal in The Punisher, where he was such a good foe for The Punisher that they, they became friends. Like, there's no detente in the world of The Punisher until Josh Stewart's character shows up. And it's like, my God, you can take the biggest beat and and dole out. Let's just uh, call this one even. <laughs> Your heart's in the right place. <laughs> so, I mean, it was uh, The Collector. It was really late in the... Um casting and I, I think he was kind of hired on a friday and we were shooting on a monday and he, and he flew in and i mean that's and so it was uh who, who cast the was it monica Mickelson? did she cast monica. the first one yeah yeah and so she found him and he was great and he was such a trooper i mean like uh, she came down to what did we shoot louisiana right louisiana oh, report locations and it was like such a horrible shoot with like it was cold we're constantly outside it's nights like just beat to shit like he actually one night when uh we were shooting on a road it's after he gets hit by the cop car and he's on his back and we have this crane up and like it was so cold they turn on the rain machine and be like cue the rain and everyone goes running and you just have to lay there as it like covered him in water and it was so cold that he actually froze to the road and we're like who put a white wig on josh it was like he's like <laughs> yeah. and this is the, that was like day two yeah i mean like first day was easy and like, oh, that's great and then day two was like keep mag in the mud Stuart." <laughs> but he was like you know he's, he's another one of those guys where like he's just an actor's actor and he can say anything and make it sound good and like once oh once, gosh first he's time is ready boom does it mm -hmm. once for safety moving on yep. and so like when you're making you know movies on a budget uh you need people like that especially like when we were out there shooting this this new one where he what he brought everything he's been through in those in the adult years you know no longer uh now he is a father since one and two in real life yeah. like my gosh so when the when the violence and the anger happens and the man who is the fly and the shadow of himself that is the spider finally go at it it is it was cathartic for me. It was just, that's just therapy. You know, it's a way to get it out. Whatever you got in the basement that feels like life's pushing on you. Uh, yeah. That's, that's what's nice is to be able to look and say like, all right. Yeah. And, and, will, and it's like, why do we keep going back to him? So it was, he's, he's like a good, he's just, he's a good actor and he's a good person to have around. Yeah. And, you know, when you in any situations, you just, there's so much shit going on. Like when he shows up, there's one less thing you have to worry about because it's not just him, but it's how he affects other actors as well, mm -hmm. where he, if, if he, he's on and so sharp all the time, same thing with Tobin, like, mm -hmm. like, to you're like, Tobin's doing it and he's the star of the movie. So like fucking do it. And it's just, you know, and he brings it. So if you're, if your first person brings it, then everyone else knows, okay, I, I can't fuck around. Like I got to be good, you know? And so that's that's why you have to have people like that around. And you and so you understand how certain actors and directors have relationships, and it's because of that. Like you just you need someone to show up, to really show up, you know. Now, is there a reason that you have recast the collector every time, a different person from each movie? Because the third one's yeah. a new guy, right? Oh yeah, yeah. And there every and you know it's kind of one of the little secrets we wanted to keep in our uh, uh, in the pocket, uh, but. What is the best shadow for where Arkin is at? You know, and that was the thing. So when you had Josh versus Juan in the first one, these were still folks forming. And then in the second one, because it was, it was almost like a James Bond, an NC-17 James Bond villain at times. Mm -hmm. You know, born of like a bit of a rattle and hum that U2 movie. That's why when I'd introduce him, like 
he was the Bono in the rafters you know, at that nightclub. Uh, and then this one, it's got to be like, oh, what if they both had something to lose, but could not let go of their inherent desire to see each other suffer, even at their own destruction? Okay. Has it been even said who the new guy is? Was it? Was... Oh, yeah. His name is Peter Giles. And he was, uh, again, a, a marvelous collaborator. Uh, he was our pilgrim in Pilgrim. And I tell you, this is a kind man. This is an awesome man. And he has the voice and the aesthetics of, of a, he can be a modern Vincent Price. He can play the buddy. He can play the intimidator. He, there's, there's an everything awesome about him that is neat to see go. Yeah. I mean, w one of the personal disappointments of the collected debacle is people not being able to see him play the role because he's so good. Yeah. And because it's, it's with the third one, we see more of the collector in his own personal space. We don't see his face or anything like that, but um, you see him differently. Peter's the kind of actor we, we wanted. He brings this certain um, weight and like intensity with just his mannerisms. And so we want, we wanted, and so he was, he's, he's really good in the stuff he, he does. And it's it's just uh, such a bummer. Like it's like. So, do you think if if this thing ends up happening, if it does yeah. continue, he he definitely will be back for sure. Oh, oh yeah. well, I mean, I mean he, he shot a lot. Yeah, he shot a lot. Like he, he probably shot more than anyone. I'd say. Yep. Right? But he and uh, uh, I mean, really, we those days were were just jam packed, and yet. Because also we had key crew carryover with Eric Leach, director of photography from The Neighbor, BJ McDonald, who not only did second unit directing, but was an operator. So we could move so quickly, safely, that the bigger days, and one of my favorite things, there was a producer who was like, how are you going to get through this day? How are you going to get through this day? It's like, well, you're only wasting time asking me. Why don't you just watch us and we'll do it. And we did. And we finished an hour and a half early and then just did cool poster trailer shots. Yeah. But it's you can work so quickly in silence and then you've got this knowing that the schedule, knowing what we would have to do and want it to feel like a competitor to the stimulus of the first two movies, but be responsible within the art of what our time and budget was supposed to be. Uh, we knew we had to have a certain tempo and that was rehearsed as much yeah. as the dialogue and the action. And we, we even talked to, about the collective at all like even online when people say stuff like can't wait to see it we just say like yeah great yeah, or whatever we i mean but we haven't said that we haven't been shooting since 2019 and there's no shooting in the future um so the, so this is a scoop uh, sure is. I mean, it, it is because you know we just you know because we were hopeful like okay yeah, maybe it works out but then you're like come on like when your girlfriend te cheats on you the fifth time yeah maybe you should <laughs> probably move on um <laughs> And so, like, yeah, so, like, even it was a few months ago when Bloody Disgusting posted some new pics, and it was like, those aren't new. Those, those aren't new. Like, those are, and then, and it's funny because a few people on it are in the, in the, in the talkback were like, these aren't even like um, high resolution as high as they should be for a still release because they're not. They're just taking stills taken from the movie. Mm -hmm. Like, we shot eight days and just, just things that were taken from it in the in the low res version. Yeah, when that's, I saw know. that article, I contacted Marcus because I was talking to Tom Atkins and I said, "Oh, did yeah. you go? Are you back he's on like, the film? Are you? You know?" And he's like, "I have no idea what you're talking about." And I go, "I, I was under yeah. the impression the article gave the impression that filming was happening and again. It was moving forward." And he was like, did I get fired? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, did. he was Well, and then look at that right there. Yeah. So like, let's say our conversation and our openness to this point bristles the feather of who's responsible. So now you're an actor and you hear this third hand. If this, if this complete, uh, completely responsible entity thinks we don't have a right to feel upset, ignored and enraged, um, we could settle that. We could absolutely do it because this is ridiculous. You don't do this with people's hopes. You don't not pay crew. You don't bounce don't upset checks. Tom Atkins. No, <laughs> no, you don't. I mean, ultimately, if you've got any soul caliber, you don't take advantage of people giving their all for you. Yeah. 
but uh, we've been around long enough to know that sometimes you run into those folks. And then after a while, you just want to keep on driving. Well, it's just a shitty situation all around. Well, who knows? Maybe this moment of flash of temper will ignite some movements. And in that case, everybody wins. We can go, oh, what a misunderstanding. Oh, you just forgot our emails, phone numbers, and every means to contact. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move on to... Uh, we have a huge piranha, piranha three double piranha three yeah. double yeah. yeah. Uh, let's get to, let's get to the bottom. Of that. Okay, why? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, Jacob Bassett had a question that kind of moves into our next topic. How did okay. Halloween Returns fall through, and what were you most excited to do for the movie? Give us the little short version of of what happened. I mean, it's very it's simple. It's the um, uh, Miramax own the rights and the Weinsteins left Miramax and they sort of formed the, the Weinstein company. They were optioning the rights to make subsequent Halloween movies. And they, they had to make them every three years or whatever it was. And so we were making it, we were going forward and the rights were almost about to lapse. And then the rights did lapse and Miramax took it back. And that's what happened. Now, the surprising thing is, I mean, because I've heard a similar thing happen with Hellraiser, right? But but the Weinsteins then put out those real quick, yes. quick movies just to kind of hold on to the rights, right? Is that what yes. it is? Yes. Surprisingly, so, they yeah. didn't do something like that with Hollywood. Uh, they they, they, uh, they well, were they, tricked. They, they were tricked. Did. They did. They were tricked. Oh, but there was, a, tricked. there was a timing discrepancy in one particular uh, piece of documentation. Ah, so they yeah. tried to no, do that. They, they were trying to do that. And, and, yeah, Bob was tricked at his own game. I mean, it, yeah, he, they were supposed to, Miramax was supposed to allow them to do that and tricked them. And mm -hmm. we're like, yeah, we'll extend it. And then as soon as it lapsed, they're like, we're not extending it. We're taking it back. Fuck off. That's probably how the conversation went as well. And so then it went back to Miramax. And then Miramax was like, all right, we have this great thing on our hands. What should we do with it? And then they brought in Jason Blum. And then Jason brought in Jody Hill and Danny McBride. Which was like left field. I mean, that's not, you wouldn't think that, right? And then, you know, and then they brought in John Carpenter, which I like, that's such a great smart thing. And that's, yep. you know, for people to do that, it's hard for a lot of people to do because they look at some of these old, older directors and they just don't want to deal with them. You know, kudos to him for bringing him, you know, he's a legend, right? And so just a lot of the times he's like, people just want to be heard and their opinion heard. Not that they want to push their agenda on anyone, just that, it's another person to bounce ideas off of. I mean, when we when we were working on like Hellraiser, we loved talking to Clive about it. Clive made it, created it, and he's not he wasn't precious about anything. But we would just like talk to him about like, you know, like we thought you should, this should take place on Tuesday. And he'd be like, oh, let me tell you about Tuesday. And then like, <laughs> oh my God, I never knew Tuesday was so fucking amazing. And then he goes off and he's like, good, go boys, go make. And then that'd be it. And that's all they do. Like, and, then, and right. <laughs> <laughs> but like, but then like you can't get those little pearls of wisdom if you don't go into, go in there. And it's strange how people don't want to do that. Don't want to deal with it. You know? Now, correct me if I'm wrong. I was, t I was told that since your project was originally a Weinstein project, that anything connected to that was basically couldn't be touched when that separation happened. So there was no chance yeah. for your project to move back correct. to Miramax. Is that correct? And yeah. that, I mean, that's 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 shrewd yeah. business because yeah, why risk a lawsuit? Yeah. Because it was um, Weinstein owns that script and paid for that script. So they own everything that has to do with it, but they don't own the underlying IP. Yeah. So it's kind of completely useless for them, but they could have had a claim. Like, I think initially, right when it happened, the idea was, oh, we'll just, we'll just continue to do it at Miramax. But then, um, you know, Bob is a very litigious person. And so everyone knew if we were involved with it at all, he would have some kind of a claim. Or try to at least cause trouble, and just no one wanted to, to deal with that. So, so basically, when 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 were you guys informed that that was probably the scenario, and what was the <laughs> disappointment like when you're like, "Great, this thing we've been working on is now this tainted." Big, this is this big the <laughs> disappointment. Yeah, Piranha Two was this one, and there was this one. 
<laughs> um, yeah, right. it was like I mean, Marcus was worse. Marcus was directing it. He was doing he was doing tests with 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 you and like yeah. yep. we were casting. Yeah. So like quick, we quick, were... quick question for yeah, you know, so people that don't know that backstory. So mm-hmm. the the whole test thing that that you're referring to. So mm-hmm. uh, I was really pushing hard with Malik to get Doug Tate to play Myers because. I thought he was perfect, perfect build. Guy is a huge Halloween nerd. It's like his dream job he's always wanted. And I don't remember how that whole thing got set up, but you you had him. You, we all met at Trancus, and you <laughs> shot footage of him in costume. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, did he between, you know, it doesn't matter now, but he pretty much had the job, right? I mean, it was looking like he was going to be the oh, guy, right? Good Lord. Well, it all came down to we were going to be like, all right, if this is an audition to play this icon, then let's put the toughest scene. And that was the one we were really being forced to do and forced to do the best we could with it was this death row, this execution, this how you do that. Because I thought the only way to do it and not you can't show the guy's face because he wouldn't be wearing his mask in any sort of chair. Uh, I may have something else on. So had to see if if Mr. Tate's performance could resonate to the fingertips, to the veins bulging, to the whatnot. And it was fun to walk all the way around him, have him perform directly from Alec, and then use that. And Sean, by the way, to all, all watchers, was uh, was there with this, this grin. So you just kind of knew. You had this barometer, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I remember uh, Doug just entirely, like, he was vibrating. And then and he'd, he'd make this sound. He'd be like, oh. All right, that's cool. And of course, Sean brought this amazing mask. So when he stepped up, he would he was bringing something to it, and he understood the uh, he grasped onto the idea right away of that this is Elvis. Like when this this entity counted out comes back in all black and just owns, like he's got a third round of puberty in him, and that was it. He was bringing it. It was really that would have been, uh, and that's the neat. That's the neat thing is I think there is a version where if everything creatively, financially, budget wise, cast wise would have been spot on. Yeah, that thing could have, I think, really been a, a hard charging, um, yeah, charging I mean, piece. But now, it's, what we got was yeah. something so phenomenal that we're all eagerly awaiting the, its part two and its part three for this universe that is talking to us about uh, grief and anger. And I think is 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 just, just talk. It cast a wider net and an important net. There's got to be just a teeny bit of bitterness to watch this thing blow up to what it's become. To be like, fuck, man, that was ours. You know, we we had it. You know. <laughs> well, actually, that has been usurped by the collected so many times over that Halloween's a good hemorrhage. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the thing is, because we all, me and Marcus, know in the back of our mind, like. Bob would have fucked it up somehow. Like <laughs> it's just because, it, and we were going in. It was getting fucked up. Like we were going along perfectly. Had this really cool script that we went back and and mimicked the style of Carpenter and Deborah Hill in the in the first one. How they wrote it in this very sparse style. Blah 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 with the Panaglide stuff and all that sort of thing. And then like no one got that. They don't know what the fuck we're talking about, right? And then it then they then Dimension starts fucking with the script. Like just doing shit and throwing things in there. And then they're like, hey, can you shoot in Bucharest? And we're like, what are you talking about? And then it's like, and then the budget, it's like, it's going to be this number. And then no, it's going to be now like 5.5. And you're like, eh. well, and it's just, and you just know it's going to get fucked uh, up. No, but then, so like, but then really a financial death blow was when at the last second, yeah, uh, one point five or six million dollars taken out of that 5.5 yeah. to incur the faulty development costs absorbed over the previous attempt yeah you? like the, the saw three right. i mean sorry the, uh, then you know, in 3d yeah yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, all, yeah, that, who knows yeah. all that stuff yeah. no it wasn't just that it was like the 12 other versions mm-hmm. that they never made and it's just that's how the wine scene works it's like it's never it's never straightforward it's never it's like all it's also like um cynical you know like the, the process and so we did we kind of knew because the thing is unless you have a even even rob rob got fucked with constantly you know and it's like so it's like you never quite got to do what 
you wanted to do and what like what made the most sense it was like always just this roundabout goofy game so we sort of knew in the back of our mind it's okay because it probably would have gotten fucked up so and so all we have left with is is you know a story and the script so and you can say you can read it and be like oh yeah that would have been fucking cool but so i think everybody who puts their heart out there and, and goes for it and wants to create for others is going to endure setbacks that crack the heart and frack the mind, but it's not how many times that happens. It's really how you can adjust, learn from it and keep moving through it. And every now and again, you get this real miracle uh, at four hours and two minutes called the Justice League where you're like, okay, somehow in all of the chaos and mayhem and pain of your, this, this artist punches through. And it just comes at, and it is uncynical, and it is perfect to him, and and I, I love it. <laughs> that I, I I you know just with it, sometimes it does work. I mean, yeah. So who knows? Maybe 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 in some weird side universe it'll. Well, you know <laughs> that after Halloween ends, it's never gonna does, end. Does it? End? No, we know. Yeah, we know. From, no, from, I mean, first no. knowledge. Yeah, once you put the end, it's definitely not the end. Well, absolutely. I kind of like the final chapter. Yeah, that was the other thing that struck me is that when you have horror, the horror icons and you've got the Marvel icons and the DC icons, well, an icon is an icon. And the more auteurs, you know, come in and give us a Joker, give us a Justice League, give us the Batman. Well, if you've got Rob Zombie's version, then wouldn't it be neat to see these other versions? And when it says the end, that's just of that trilogy. Sure, that's that's the story that they're telling. But you could certainly do something. Even our pitch was a different version within that universe, right? The first movie ended with him hitting the ground. And our movie ends with his POV looking right. up and then standing up. Yeah, it starts. Yeah, it started with that POV going. And, then... and so, and yeah, and so we're <laughs> rewriting the... I mean, we call it a recalibration. Mm -hmm. Recalibration. Well, I mean, that's all it was. Let's face it: the Halloween franchise is probably the only franchise you can think of that has kind of went back and rebooted and and ignored mm. and then went back yeah. again. And they they pretty much can do anything you want at this point. Somebody could make Halloween the return of Jamie sure. Lloyd and started in present day of Daniel Harris right. in a mental hospital and breaking out a la Halloween 78 and doing her own mm -hmm. thing. I mean, sure. you could really go anywhere with it. You could do a series, uh, you know, there's been talk about like a, a Loomis series, you know? Yep. Something well, like but how about this? Like when Quentin Tarantino mm -hmm. on uh, Eli Roth's History of Horror just says that one thing, here's what I love about Halloween. It, he sees something, he goes, I want her. And you're like, oh, please. And we know that there is, the rumors of he had some outlines or thoughts for, uh, you know, Halloween, what would be Tom H20. And I'm like, yes, I would love to see that. Like, let it be independent of canon if you want. But yeah. let the people, if, they, if they're willing to tell that story, like, who wouldn't want to see Edgar Wright take on Jason? One from his point of view, Jason's point of view. Like, what? That would be great. When Joker point, I mean, proves that that could work. Like, I don't, I don't want to see the Walking Phoenix Joker doing comic book stuff and fighting Batman. That sounds fucking stupid. Yeah. But but the, mo the, the movie's amazing, like, and it's exactly what it should have been. I mean, gosh, it's on it's on HBO a lot now, and it's like it's insane. Like, it really is. I, like, you watch, you're like, how did they, how did they make this? <laughs> I mean, how did they convince them that this is to do this? And I, you hear like, oh, the studio didn't didn't want to do it, didn't like it, and blah blah blah. I'd be like, how could you not? Jordan Moran said, question from Marcus and Patrick. After just finishing the book Taking Shape 2 and realizing how many scrapped scripts there were, were you aware of this and did this affect the script you worked on? By the way, not to blow smoke up your ass, but your script idea was definitely the best one in the book. Wow. Thank you. Thanks. I'll take smoke in lots of places. <laughs> um, yeah. Technically, we were brought on to rewrite a script. We were, we were to rewrite, what was it called? Asylum? I um, believe so. And that was written by... It had that image. The, you know, really, like, it keeps always going back to, like, how do we shrink this prison thing? And, like, just, oh, if it's got to be, it's got to be. We were on the set of Feast, and Nick Phillips, who was the executive at Dimension at the time, he was reading Jake Wade Wall's version of Asylum. And then years later, Matt Bain, and then he wrote a version, and then Stolberg and uh, Goldfinger rewrote that. 
And then we were given that and uh, I don't know who gave it to us. It's someone had to mention. And then they were stuck. Oh, no, it was Malik gave it to us, I think. And they were stuck and didn't know what to do with it. And, and they knew all that Bob liked was that one image of mm-hmm. him in jail. He's a, in, him in jail and on death row and in, a, in the electric chair. That's what he's going to sell, just that picture. So we had to do that. So we kind of reverse engineered it and said, because we were, we, were, we were reacting from fans. Like, we're just like, these movies are all over the place in the mythology and the fucking blah, 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 the thorn stuff. It's like, oh my God, it's so, it's so complicated. And so like, so what if, what if, you know, like in the first movie, he falls off and he stand up and, you know, most people would have been like, well, that's what happened in part two. But the people we're talking to you didn't know that. So or like it seemed ingenious at the moment. Um, and then you do the pan light and then you're going through and then and then it would, then he gets caught and then gets put on death row. First, but, but like he's insane, you can't kill him. Okay, well, what if no, he's proven to be not insane. And so they're gonna kill because the and then our, our whole story of he flies and said, no, he was upset, he was supposed to do it because he knew he, this guy should be killed. I'm mean, against the death penalty, but this guy should be killed. Set up his moral dilemma with that guy. And then sort of just built up from there. So we were aware and we were because a lot of the stuff we had written or heard about over the years just like felt like more more halloween like oh and then he comes back again without any kind of explanation which is stupid so our yeah we want a recalibration because the first one is amazing the first second one's pretty good the third one is has nothing to do with michael myers but has some fun stuff the fourth one's actually good and but the why was the fourth one good because the fourth one felt like the first one right and so it's just it, without too much of the mythology and so we're like what if we just wipe clean the mythology and kind of recalibrate it and start it over then you can go forward with a more of a cleaner slate so there you go. And and no one and at the same time, no one wanted to hear the origin story again. We know it. Like I guess they just still did it with the new one, but like we know it. We we don't need to go through that again because we had just come out of Rob's. So he did it well, did what he did. And people like that. So we don't. Let's not do a remake. Let's do a recalibration. Honestly, our our take was a response to all that stuff. Let's just kind of catch up with where you guys are right now. What's going on right now? What projects do you have in the works? What do you want to talk about before we close it out? We're gratefully. Uh pitching with Timor Bekmambatov, an adaptation of George Romero and Daniel Krause's The Living Dead. Oh, nice. And and we are trying like hell to finally get a Romero story told uncut, big and bad. And and it's uh in the book is sensational. So we're in the midst of that. And and but it's it's tough. You know, a lot of people have their living dead element shows or zombie shows or or whatnot, but it's kind of like, wait, this is the guy who started the whole thing. And this is his most heartfelt, please, you know, if you want to ignore me, fine, but you gotta believe me, this is coming. It's it's a wonderful, harrowing story that seems to have predicted us all the way into the future. I really need, <laughs> I need to read it. I haven't read it. Cause actually, Chris brought that book on the show once and was raving about it, saying how great it is. I haven't read oh. it yet. And it's like, really good. Yeah, it's yeah. really good. And it's and it really is like the, the the emotion you get. Like for example, there's this one tidbit, if I may spoil, an early in the book tidbit, but um, it touches upon not only racism, classism, and whatnot, but you see how there's just this, a side note about a bullied kid and his big sister is just trying to get to her little brother, knowing like, oh god, oh god, he's so you know he, he's got to be okay. Gets into the school. And here's gunfire and then sees this little bloodied kid running, boom, go again. And she has to recognize her little brother has become the active shooter. And he's he's lost it. He's like, you can shoot him twice now. You can shoot him twice now. And then like, so it's just had moments like that where, oh, my God, it's absolute horror. Mm -hmm. And then you still have to punch forward to the to the elements of, 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 of how we then see what these characters do as the world is gone, the rules are gone. And there's just these moments of folks like, you do not know what someone's going through up here if you don't know their life mm-hmm. and how just these points of pressure can elevate their moral compass or just prove they've never needed one. And this is the story of those two factions coming to a, coming to a head when humanity itself is on the line. Do you know the... Artist Gris Grimley. Oh yeah, I know him. So we're doing um, Frankenstein. Oh nice. With him. Mm-hmm. Um, we're also working on that's going to be like a half hour animated limited series, and 
uh, this guy, Pete Candeland, who did um, all the Gorillaz videos, and Michael Gracie, who did Greatest Showman, are directing it, and Junkie XL is doing the music. Which is rad. I mean, he, he, talk about serendipity. I think it was, did Michael reach out to him? And he's like, I just finished watching all the Frankenstein films. Let me see. The yeah, yeah. Oh! <laughs> and, then the, and then also working on his uh, Brothers Grimm yeah. thing. Ah, it's fucking cool. Nice. So those are really fun. Like those are fun ones. Um, Cause it's a really interesting time now with like the streaming stuff and you don't have to just do features. You can do things that are longer and weird and, you know, and uh, like the Netflix and Hulu's of the world enjoy longer form type things that aren't. And, and there's, there's, they, they'd be animated, but in a really sophisticated style, of, like that's going to bring Gris's style to life. And, um, it should be pretty unique and cool. Like something that the horror world hasn't quite seen before. Yeah, I've, I've always a, liked his stuff. And uh, I know. It's, it's really I'm, cool, I'm right? surprised oh. it never really broke through. Well, he's got Pinocchio. Pinocchio is being done with Guillermo at Netflix. Mm-hmm. And that's probably going to be ridiculously cool. Because yeah. um, you know Guillermo. He'll just like make it fucking cool. Yeah. So that, yeah. that, that that's going on. And then these would be on the he- on the heels of that. Of all the things you can connect on with someone in our first hangout with with Grizz over this new Zoom world, um, our way in was talking about the music. What what did he hear when he was thinking of this? And that led us into a conversation about James O'Barr and the Crow and the the original original uh, playlist that you could get with uh, the original printing, mm-hmm. and then you know complemented by some wonderful covers and a beautiful film in an amazing score with a great soundtrack to boot and how like, well, let's build this with the sound in mind mm-hmm. of this world. So it doesn't feel stuck in, in an era, but feels to be an amalgamation of this yeah. feeling. Yeah. You know, don't, that's, don't, that's, say, don't say steampunk, but it's got some of that in it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, the, what's the one word like, you never say yeah. in these developing meetings, but he has that style, right? Yeah. Like that's his style. And so it, it's, Seeing stuff like something like that come to life is really cool. And like the the theme golf, the Axis Axis the Animation House, they did a test for it. It's really fucking cool. It's like it's yep. really amazing. So that's a pretty cool thing. Those are some pretty cool things we're working on. Those three. Yep. And then uh, we've got a. We're going to see. We might have a, a, a film project with uh, Timor as well. That's that's one of those. Uh, We'll see. Yeah, fingers are crossed on that one. But it's all of this has been pandemic development. So from thought to thing, here we are. And now we're seeing that that light at the end of this long, long tunnel that maybe we'll get out and have these things play and reflect us as much as we hope they will. Well, hey, guys, I appreciate you spending a lot of time with us today. Well, us, it's probably a good thing Christopher wasn't here because we, we had that would have been one more person chiming in that would have, wouldn't have been able to hear so much from you guys probably but uh, i really appreciate the time and thanks for coming on hey this was awesome thanks for listening and sharing and caring i love it i love this and you're like great and then they go but can you remake? Oh, he froze. Yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs>